the title. Um, oh, what is it? Security assumptions, I guess. Okay, cool. All right. So we're going to go ahead and get started. So I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Andrew Polstra, who's going to be talking to us about security incentives. Yep. Cool. Um, so I've got a timer here. Should this be starting? A little device. That's fine. Ten forty-seven. Okay. Hi guys. I'm uh, Andrew Polstra. I'm a developer for the Lib SecP two fifty six K one project, which is um, which um, is a library that does the underlying sort of traditional cryptography in Bitcoin. Um, so I'm I'm going to talk to you guys a bit about security assumptions, um, security assumptions, security models, trust models, and stuff. And so to try to give you guys a, a high level overview of how we ought to be thinking about these sorts of problems of, of scaling and, and efficiency and decentralization and stuff. Um, because Bitcoin ultimately is a crypto system. It is the entirety of Bitcoin. It's not just like the digital signature, it's not just the script system, it's not just proof of work or anything. Everything about Bitcoin is a crypto system and it needs to be designed sort of with a security mindset, which means I guess the, the buzzword that we like to use is adversarial thinking. So when we design Bitcoin, we want things to be working even in an adversarial setting, which is sort of an unfamiliar mode of thinking, I think, for probably for most people and, and probably for most areas of, um, of research. So as an example that um, a friend of mine likes to use on IRC, you can imagine asking a building designer or like a structural engineer to say, well, I want you to design this building and you know it, it needs to be it needs to be structurally sound, you know, in the case of like weird weather, you know, strong winds, hurricanes, heavy rains and stuff. And then also, if anybody is, uh, studies your plans in detail and deliberately tries to destroy your building, it shouldn't be heard. Um, and that's just not feasible. That can't be done in real life. That can't be done for most systems. And even where it can be done, it's not practical. It's just incredibly expensive to, um, to build things that are secure against just outlandish um, attack scenarios. And usually we try to... Uh, I mean, this is why we have legal, legal infrastructure in, in place. A lot of society is sort of built around preventing adversarial behavior because it's so difficult to intrinsically prevent. However, in cryptography, we don't have these benefits. We're working online, especially in Bitcoin, where a lot of things are anonymous or pseudonymous, or at least difficult to trace, um, where anybody can connect to anybody and basically do anything. And if it's possible to hurt the system adversarially, um, then somebody will be able to do it from somewhere in the world. We can't just sort of assume that, you know, they'll be visible or they'll be caught or something. Okay? So to give an example of this sort of adversarial thinking, um, let me talk briefly about a bug that we had in libsecb 256 k one about three or four months ago. And this was um, a very technical bug. Uh, what it was is that we had a problem with our group addition formula that was very... This problem, we don't know... Well, I know that it cannot be exploited with the interface that we had back then. It was basically not a useful, not a usable bug for attackers, at least at the time. Um, and it was extremely difficult to hit. What it was is that for roughly one in every two to the 128 inputs to our group addition function, the addition will be wrong. So what I mean by that is that for every single point on our curve, there exist two other points, such that if you add this point and, and one of its two bad points, you will just get the wrong answer. Okay. And what this means is that the higher level crypto system is going to give you the wrong answer, something that um, a signature that should be correct isn't, isn't correct, or something that should be verifying isn't verifying, or something. And this is incredibly rare. You can't hit this by accident. Um, well, you can't hit it just by chance, I guess. And all of the systems that, that we have sort of, um, or all of our existing crypto systems that we use, put random inputs into this, assuming all is well. So you might think we could sort of ignore this bug. We could pretend this didn't happen. But because we are, um, this is a cryptographic tool, and we can't predict how people are going to use this in the future, we can't predict what kind of extensions, we realized that we had to fix this bug. And we, um, our initial solution was very, it, took, it was a big hit in terms of efficiency. This would have cost us like an extra 50% in signature production, I think, or verification. And then over time, we, we managed to get it down from 50% then to 25%, and then, um, eight and then three I think is where we finally landed. We, we were actually very surprised that it was possible to fix this. Um, but at no point did we say, hey, you know, this is really hard to hit. This will never ever happen by chance. And in our existing system, you can't hit it, so let's just not fix it. That's just not, we can't think that way because if we think that way, what will happen is that we'll have like an addition formula that's wrong for, for a certain class of in inputs we believe we can't hit. 
and then one day in the future we'll add another crypto system that uses this as a primitive, we'll have forgotten that, hey, wait a minute, our addition is secretly not addition. It's, it's addition with this caveat that never mattered until now. And then something bad will go wrong. So this is what adversarial thinking gets you. Um, and so this is, this is sort of difficult enough in traditional cryptography, where the assumptions that we make when we're thinking adversarially are pretty uncontroversial. For something like ECDSA signatures, we're thinking, the assumptions we require are things like, well, every participant has to be at most like a polynomial time probabilistic Turing machine, you know, um, or maybe like a, a quantum Turing machine. Um, and then that, that's pretty uncontroversial. I mean, that, that's, we have a lot of physical evidence this is true. And then secondly, we say, well, a couple like specific mathematical problems should be very difficult to solve. So one is like the discrete log assumption. And this um, is probably not too controversial to say this is probably not possible with a probabilistic polynomial time computer. We know that it is with a quantum computer, so, so I guess the, the clock is ticking on that. But these are the assumptions we're making. And with these very simple, at least easy to formulate, um, and I hope very believable assumptions, we then have to do the, this adversarial thinking mode, and then we find that things are actually very difficult and very technical. However, in Bitcoin, we, um, in addition to having this, this is sort of the boring part of Bitcoin, script verification and stuff. This is the stuff that everybody, nobody even thinks about because it sort of just works. I mean, we, we complain sometimes that it's maybe not as expressive as we want, but it just works. Um, what's novel in Bitcoin is this proof of work scheme, is this mining scheme. And what this is, what this is there for, I guess, is as a way to develop a consensus on the ordering of transactions so we can detect double spends. And we want it to be a distributed consensus or a de decentralized consensus. And the reason is that there are some problems that miners solve that are sort of intrinsically impossible to solve cryptography, cryptographically. Um, so one is simply that we can't cryptographically enforce that they never shut down, right? If they just pack up and go home, then the system stops. So we, we, sort of want, we sort of want them to keep going. Another thing is censorship resistance. It's impossible cryptographically to prove that a miner is aware of something and then did not, then did not put it into a block. Um, simply this proving awareness thing is not, it's sort of conceptually difficult. It's conceptually impossible to prove mathematically. Um, so again, we want incentives for, for miners to, to include transactions, but then we want to balance that without creating incentives for miners to create fake transactions and fill their blocks with this, right? So, um, and then finally, there is this notion of double spending. What miners are there for is to prevent double spending. So we want them to all sort of agree to extend the same history and then to not be deliberately forking it and even to not be accidentally forking it. And a lot of what, a lot of Bitcoin's design is sort of enforce these things because these are the things that we can't do cryptographically. And the, um, and the last one is maybe the, the most, uh, sort of the weirdest one, sort of the, the, the fifth postulate of security thinking where it, it appears that there is no universal time. There's no way to get a universal clock. And so what we do, we, we do this giant proof of work thing and we sort of say, well, we're going to take our universal clock, our universal clock to be, the, um, to be induced from the block ordering of the longest block, you know, the, of the chain that the most people have put the most work into, I guess. Um, and so all these things are, we, we can't do it cryptographically, so we add these extra assumptions. We add, we, we add incentive structures, I guess, that will hopefully induce people to do the right thing. And, um, and this is how Bitcoin is designed. And then on top of this, so th this is already very difficult. So now I, I want to remind you guys that we still need to think adversarially about this. And I'm glad I, I didn't realize this when, when I set up this talk, but the next speaker's talk is, is, has the title, um, what is it? In an adversarial setting, blockchains don't scale. And that's, so I guess this talk will sort of serve as, as an introduction to this. Um, so we have, <laughs> We have these problems already. The reason that Bitcoin is, is so slow is that we want this decentralization. We want decentralization in these properties that we can't really cryptographically enforce, okay? So it's easy to do things like decentralized signature verification, right, or decentralized creating correct signatures because you create a signature, everybody, anybody who wants to verify that it's correct can just verify it. Decentralizing things like time ordering is not so easy and that's how we have all this mining and stuff. And so, when we talk about, I guess, I guess scaling, scaling Bitcoin, Bitcoin, we talk, we talk most, most frequently we care about, care about this, this, this speed problem, speed throttling problem, problem this throw put problem. Um, uh, so a lot of people, like for example, compare Bitcoin throughput to that of Visa's. But nobody, nobody else says, hey, wait a minute, what if we just replace Bitcoin with Visa? So it's sort of this intuitive understanding that we can't just 
take all take of this information you've created, created to avoid the central um, single point of failure or censorship risk or shutdown risk or anything. We can't just throw them out. But there's still, there's still a desire, desire to somehow move toward um, towards something faster, with better throughput, with, with better sort of efficiency. And it's important that we make this explicit. This is what we're doing. Okay? Because if we go so far, so I guess what I'm saying is that a lot of scalability proposals for Bitcoin sort of change the change security the model, change security. the trust model, change the dynamic at least. Um, and so one, uh, one example of that that I want to talk about, if I have, I do have time. Um, one example um, that, that I should mention uh, briefly is the segregated is, witness thing that another speaker is going to describe. And what segregated witness is, is, is a way is of a way splitting of off transaction signatures from transaction data that. in blocks. And this allows, this allows verifiers, verifiers, so people just putting the blockchain trying to make sure it's correct, to make a conscious decision for every single transaction, whether they want to verify that that transaction is correct, is properly, uh, that the transaction signature is correct, that it's properly formed or the valid digital signature satisfies the script however it's supposed to. For each transaction, they can choose whether or not to do that, or they can choose to just sort of trust that if it got into a block, then full verifiers would have complained about it, right? And, um, and so they're sort of trusting that the rest of the network, or, or at least the miner who produced the block that they're doing, made sure that the signature was correct. And so if they get a witness, sort of that's just have this really fine grain trade off, like per transaction on a given block. Say, do we want so called SPB security, where we're trusting the miners, we're trusting the proof of work to indicate that the transaction is correct? Or do we want do we full want cryptographic full security, security where we're checking every single thing um, and we're making sure we're making all the sure So I, I chose this example because it's not very really explicit, very, very granular trade off, I guess. But most scaling proposals in Bitcoin are like this. We have a few that are just, I guess, net wins. You know, we, we do stuff like uh, work on improving the cryptography, work on improving the underlying algorithm. Sometimes we can get like a net win. But these net wins are like, you know, small, like, Five, ten percent, you know, maybe twenty, thirty percent. These are not dramatic things that are going to allow Bitcoin to scale beyond, um, I guess, current uh, transaction throughput numbers substantially, or, or not qualitatively, I should say. You know, if Bitcoin can handle, you know, five times as many transactions as it can handle today, that'll be pretty awesome. But it's not going to. That's not a game changer at all. When people talk about being unable to do things because of Bitcoin's throughput, um, what they mean is that we need sort of orders of magnitude more transaction. Um, the ability to verify orders of magnitude is more transaction. And for these kinds of things, these are where we need to change um, our security assumption and we need to change our trust models. And I guess the point of this talk, circling back to the beginning, is that when we do this, we have to remember that the security thing, um, the security model, the trust model, are cryptographic, I guess, or they should be, be thought of cryptographic. They should be thought of with an adversarial mindset. Because even though we can't verify them cryptographically, they are still security assumptions. And we still have to think adversarially. We can't be saying things like, oh, you know, this, this will almost never happen, you know, or, or this will never happen, you know, or, or most transactions are structured where, where this part of the transaction is, is purely random and they're just never going to hit this weird edge case or something like that. Or you can't say, oh, well, unless this group of people all colludes in the following way, we'll all be fine. This is, Bitcoin works in an adversarial setting. If there are failure modes that can be found somehow, that can be targeted, they will be targeted. Um, and this is true, this is, almost, this is almost not worth saying, or this is almost um, something we, we never explicitly say in traditional cryptography because it's so ingrained, it's so old. Um, but when we move from these traditional cryptographic assumptions, which are like hard computational problems and stuff, into this more nebulous region where we're thinking about incentives and, um, and I guess, uh, economic things and trust things and, and what are people going to do, how are people going to collude, uh, what do people want to do, what will people make money if they do, what will they lose money if they do, this sort of stuff. Um, these are traditionally the domain of more, uh, I guess, more traditional ways of thinking, right? Ways of thinking where you assume that, you know, people know each other or at least subconsciously you assume people know each other, people won't try to screw each other, people have reasons not to screw each other, there will be some sort of legal infrastructure, there will be some sort of consequence. This is not the world that Bitcoin lives in. We're solving the same sort of problems, but now we're having to bring these very difficult um, requirements on our modes of thinking into these much more nebulous areas. And this is why these problems are so difficult. I mean, this is why we're having these conferences. This is why, uh, this is why there's, I guess, any controversy at all in this space, is that these problems are hard, and they're not only hard to solve, but they can be hard to think about as well. Um, 
and I don't know how much time I have. Oh, I guess about five minutes. So that is the meat of my talk. So let me move on to almost the second topic was just this. Oh, okay. Never mind. All right. Sorry, I'm reading, I'm reading that clock. This is five minutes. All right. If I have no time to wrap up, I'm not going to go to my second subject, which is basically trying to motivate decentralization and talk about decentralization of miners and, and validators, which are two sort of distinct entities. And sometimes their incentives do not line up. And this adds sort of another layer of complexity to this. And then we've got multiple participants with potentially different incentives, and this restricts the, um, our ability to develop solutions to these sorts of things. And um, yeah, I, I guess that's guess all I have time to say. So I'll stop there. Um, are there any questions? Let's take questions. Over here. Regarding decentralization, um, what proposals do the, uh, I guess, are, are better and which are worse from an adversarial standpoint? Um, so I guess a, a solution that would not be great from an adversarial standpoint would be something like, hey, how about we, um, we replace these, these mining with like a signal signature? How about we just have like some authority who decides the ordering of blocks and signs things? And this is bad for, from an adversarial perspective because not only do you now have sort of one entity who's able to, uh, to compromise the ordering of transactions himself, now he's a target. So now any people who want to attack the system will have a single thing to target um, and that would, be, uh, that would be bad, right? Um, that, that would greatly increase the risk that something would go wrong. Whereas something like, for example, the lightning, um, lightning proposal, that does change the trust model, but does so sort of locally, I guess. So individual transactors now have the ability to um, individually decide to what degree they are trusting each other not to double spend. And they also, um, they also guess, have a fallback, where if things go wrong, they then have this rollback option, which is a bit more expensive and stuff. And so that's much better from an adversarial setting, both because you avoid the single point of failure risk and because the failure mode is much more controlled because it sort of reduces to Bitcoin. So you, you allude to the prior assumptions of trust in some of these, uh, the ways that we've previously thought. Um, what are some frameworks uh, that we can use to approach the different social assumptions of Bitcoin as we're designing these new systems? Um, so I guess that you're asking, can, you like, can I like enumerate some different trust models and how Bitcoin fits into this? more approaches, I guess. Okay, so the Bitcoin trust model, I guess, what we would hope is sort of one in which, for at least for transaction ordering, censorship re resistance, we have sort of miners all over the world sort of individually um, sort of fighting for the next block. And so there is no, you don't have this sort of clustering, you don't have any of these um, single point of failure or single targets, I guess. Um, in fact, what, what um, appears to actually uh, have happened in the Bitcoin space, we have a lot more clustering, we have a lot more centralization in the mining world than we would maybe like if our goal is decentralization. Um, so things that approach this is something where we could, for example, rather than having a single entity like, like a bank or a um, clearinghouse deciding which transactions go through, you could have like a federation, for example, where you have like some fixed group of like 10 or 100 people, whatever. Um, and you need like a majority of them to agree or something. And so that, um, that's obviously, that's not like decentralization what we want, but it is sort of a cheap approximation, which maybe is sufficient in some, in some scenarios, although not, certainly not for what Bitcoin does, but, um, but th that's an example of an approximation, I guess. Okay, next question over there. Um, so we have an IRC question. Uh, okay. The question is, how do you think about security assumptions on cryptographic protocol layer assumptions? So the security model of underlying security primitives is mature enough, but protocol layer may be changed and we should care about attacks there, a la attacks that you see on TLS and other IETF protocols. Oh, I really like that question. Um, so what do, what do I think about this? Um, but I'm going to answer that instead of giving a real answer to the, to the question. Um, what I think is that this is, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. A lot of tooling and, and ways of thinking need to, um, we need to um, sort of radically change the way that we design these protocols. Because right now, basically, protocols are developed, they're laid out, they're, they're written out and specified, and we sort of expected that everybody uh, follow them more or less. And we have 
we try to design ways to make sure that even by violating the protocol, bad things can't happen. But what we would like is a way to sort of computationally verify that the protocol is resilient against failures like this. And I've seen a few papers about this. The one that I read um, just yesterday was this paper called Session Types for Rust, which is a way of using a strong typing system in a language such as, such as Rust or, or Haskell or, or ML or something to basically describe your protocol in a way that when you actually go to implement it, the compiler will prevent you from accidentally violating the protocol or for violating it in very egregious ways. And then using things like that, you're then able to sort of prove that you've implemented the protocol correctly and you avoid things, well, the dream is you can avoid things like Heartbleed because they simply, your code won't compile if you have these, these weird failure modes. Um, so tools like that are, are the stuff that we need to be developing and we are, and there's been a lot of progress in this area. It's, it's very exciting. Anything else? I think that's it. Um, before we introduce the next speaker, we have a quick reminder. If you're interested in giving a work in progress talk, please sign up b before lunch is over. And you can find a link for this on the official Scaling Bitcoin Twitter feed. Thank you, Andrew. That was cool. great. Thanks, Thanks guys. Thank you. Our next speaker is Peter Todd. And we'll speak about in adversarial, adversarial environments, blockchains don't scale. Yeah, so um, thanks for the talk on uh, half of what I would have gone and spoken about. So uh, that's actually very convenient and uh, really helpful. That was uh, very useful. Um, I kind of, I'm going to go start with um, talking really about one of these sort of nitty gritty uh, applications of where adversarial thinking is relevant to incentives around decentralization. And, you know, I think this. There are many different issues with uh, increasing block sizes, but this is kind of one of the uh, immediate ones that kind of uh, limits us in an environment where everyone has all the data. And, you know, when I go and say scale, I mean, remember, we're talking about can we go get many orders of magnitude improvement, not, you know, can we get five, can we get ten times, but rather, do we have a system that has fundamentally different scaling characteristics? And I think this will show that if everyone has all the data, we uh, potentially have issues. So in uh, my little scenario here, we can imagine uh, a blockchain apparently recently started with three blocks and uh, we have Chinese miners and the US miners. And uh, if China finds the next block, well, they're behind the Great Firewall of China, which uh, I had the pleasure of uh, interfacing with last week and I can tell you it's rather slow to get any data across. And it's quite likely before the US side even learns about China's new block that they're going to go find uh, another block. And the problem pretty much comes down to, well, who's going to find the next block after that? Who's going to win the tie? And depending on how the hashing power is distributed, it'll be China. And eventually, both sides come to consensus and they learn about each other's blocks. Now, I th this is a pretty well-known feature of Bitcoin. This is how... Um, the system works, but there's a very big catch here, which is, what's interesting is when you talk about this in terms of incentives, um, in terms of kind of failure modes, which is you might ask, well, what percentage of hashing power does the Chinese side in this example need for them to come out ahead, as in for them to go earn more money than the other side? And you can do the math on this, and it turns out to be certainly 50% and probably about 30%. Which is really interesting because then you can kind of ask the question, well, hang on, if I'm behind the Great Firewall of China and I don't happen to bother making my internet connection better to the rest of the world, do I have an incentive to improve the situation? It's not really clear that you do um, in many scenarios, which now means, hang on, if I'm not in China, how do I get into the mining game? How do I go add to the decentralization of Bitcoin? You know. What's the long-term progression of this? It could very well be a scenario where once you kind of bump up to these limits, hashing power is going to end up being in one place because that's what's most profitable. And, you know, we've gone and done a lot of work. Um, Matt Carallo's uh, Relay Network is a great example where we go and essentially use compression techniques to compress blocks, pre-propagate the data, pre-propagate the transactions, and when a block's actually found, Rather than sending the whole block, you simply send a list of transactions, say, 
the block contains this transaction, this transaction, this transaction, and very quickly distribute everything. Now, in normal circumstances, this would work really well, but this is Bitcoin. This is adversarial thinking. If I'm the miner off in China, it might be in my advantage to make sure the relay network doesn't work. Because if I'm going to get my blocks to more than 30%, and I'm not thinking in terms of higher level issues, such as maybe the harm to the Bitcoin price or so on, I'm just thinking about how much money I'm going to make next week, next month. I don't necessarily want the relay network to work because that helps my competitors. You know, this is an example where in an adversarial environment, something that would otherwise work really well doesn't scale. And uh, as we've alluded to before, currently the distribution of hashing power is fairly lopsided. Although I'll make the point that these numbers should be taken with a grain of salt because of course something bad happens. We're currently still in a situation where it's very easy to start new pools. So, you know, I'm not actually that worried about that graph. I'd be much more worried about that graph if it didn't change every once in a while. And uh, I think this is from September, and uh, you'll notice the order of who's, who's on top's changed. So if we're going to go talk about, well, how can we go scale this thing? I mean, we could start talking about existing theory and databases. Um, you know, ultimately, Bitcoin, one way to look at it is just a big unspent coin database. And uh, as with most computer science, I'll put a tree on it. And you can imagine all the coins in the system in this database, and I can find every coin by its unique identifier. And when I go spend uh, a coin, I'm updating an entry in the database. You know, and this looks much like standard database applications. I mean, you can imagine a customer database, personnel database, a bunch of numbered people. And this all works very well, and if the number of items in my database gets too big, well, I can go start sharding it. I can go and split um, split up the key space. In this case, I have four different servers running it. If I need to make modification, obviously I just go to the server responsible for that part of the key space. I do whatever I need to do and so on. And normally in databases, this works really well. It's a very valid scenario. But what's interesting is asking, why, do, why is this hard in Bitcoin? And this really comes down to, well, what are we using Bitcoin for? Well, we're doing transactions. Transactions aren't unknown, contrary to maybe what many of the Bitcoin people would like to say in terms of blockchain tech. Most databases actually have transactions under the hood. You know, and that's how you get consistency and uh, roll back and so on. Well, in Bitcoin, the transaction graph is probably the most important thing. And, you know, as we build on blocks, well, we take coins and we spend them and create new coins and so on and so forth. Sometimes coins are merged together. Um, sometimes they're split apart and the system progresses. Now, if you went and sharded that database, um, split it across that key space, obviously this can work. You know, when I went, would make a transaction, I would go to the various parts of the Bitcoin ecosystem that hold my coin and say, hey, I want to go spend it. Please commit it to this new part and I'll make a new coin come into existence in that part of the database. In a standard system, this would work really well. The problem is, Bitcoin has this issue where the data in the database depends on earlier data. Now, here, if I have one single invalid transaction, that very first red Bitcoin, if you will, its act on the rest of the data is viral in the sense that everything after it is now invalid. And if my definition of a blockchain is everything and it's valid, now I'm in a scenario where if I try to split up this database, I'm trusting other people to do the right thing. I'm potentially trusting in an adversarial environment other Bitcoin miners to not create fake money. And as an aside, I've actually done a lot of work, um, fintech work for banks and so on, advising them about their architectures. And I think what's really interesting is how when they go look at blockchains, even though they're in an environment where they have the law on their side, where everyone knows who everyone is, where if something goes wrong, you can go call up a person and say, hey, let's go fix this. The smarter clients, they're actually pretty terrified of blockchains because even in that kind of very benign environment compared to Bitcoin, if something goes wrong, it's not really clear how to roll back. You know, if you go find out after the fact that one of your counterparties, another bank screwed up, and now there's a million dollars of fake money, it isn't an easy thing to fix. And if you actually look at how banking works right now, 
even though they technologically could have done blockchains for um, quite a long time, they don't. They go use systems where, you know, if I'm going to go and transact with you, I'll go have a correspondent um, bank account. And preventing a double spend is now that bank's problem. You know, it's all localized. If something goes wrong, it's localized. Bitcoin doesn't have this property because we have transactions. And this makes applying conventional thinking very, very difficult. I would go as far to make the claim in an adversarial environment, I can't scale this by splitting it up. You know, we need better technology for that. Which really gets us to, well, what solutions do we have? Um, as alluded to earlier, Lightning is a great example of a system that helps scalability by limiting the kind of trust you're involved. You know, in something like the Lightning um, system, if I'm going to send money through another node, yes, there's trust involved, but it's piecewise trust. If that trust is broken, I wait a while for the timeouts to trigger and I eventually get my money back, but the whole ecosystem as a whole isn't infected by this mistake. Um, you know, mistakes aren't built upon one another, and you're always going back to the simple, easy to verify consensus blockchain if something go does go wrong. Uh, similarly, uh, systems like ChangeTip. I mean, again, even simpler, but I trust ChangeTip with my money. I might not trust very much of it, but if something goes wrong, it's limited to ChangeTip. And these are all technological solutions that are very uh, easy to implement and very clear that they work. They have flaws, but at least you're not risking an ecosystem-wide uh, event if something goes wrong. Longer term, though, I think it would be nice we could find ways to go scale up blockchains. And uh, I'm not going to present these full, you know, this stuff fully in depth, but uh, one of the ideas you, that's kind of been uh, out in the space is this notion that, well, maybe miners shouldn't validate. You know, if miners don't validate and you allow invalid stuff in the chain, now you don't have these potential issues of I'm building on part of the blockchain and you're building on part of the blockchain and you screwed up, well now I'm harmed. One thing you can actually do is say, well if I'm going to give you money, why don't I give you a proof that all the transactions, all the data in the blockchain, or that part of the blockchain, now that it can be split up, that corresponds to a real money. And in this kind of system, it's certainly inconvenient. I can't just go say, well, trust that miner to ensure you have money. But if I go provide you the correct data, I can go prove to you very convincingly that yes, that money is real. Unfortunately, the most naive way to do it is a sort of quasi-exponential scaling. Because in a real economy, all the coins kind of merge together. You have very uh, high rates of mixing. Uh, I know Gregory Maxwell um, did the work for me once and figured uh, you know, you know, how quickly do coins mix? And essentially, going back maybe six months, pretty much every coin has been mixed with every other coin on the chain because that's how rapidly the economy works. But we do have a trick up our sleeve. And uh, we can linearize this history. Now, I'm sure the snark guys are going to laugh at me when I explain how uh, this is done, given how simplistic it is. But it's a good sign that it can be simple, which is going back again. So if I have that yellow coin there, the one I want to prove to you, if I ensure that all the inputs to that coin have actually been spent, have actually been recorded irrevocably, if I pick at random one of those inputs, I can put myself in a position where probabilistically, certainly some of the time I'll get away with creating a fake coin if I'm an adversary, as in I make a transaction where one real coin goes in and the other input doesn't actually exist. Half the time, I'll pick the input that's real. Great, I've created money out of there. Half the time, I pick the input that isn't real. I've now destroyed my money. You can do the math on this, and it's plausible to go from this crazy, oh, you know, exponential blow up to a linear um, type of proof, where the amount of data I have to go give to you is linear in sort of the age of the system. The other trick you can go do is use inflation in that if coins are getting created on occasion, well, newly created coins have no history. And if the proof crunches through and it happens to pick a newly created coin as input it's proving, I've now shortened the proof. And this gets to some sort of O1 scaling with an incredibly high constant. And finally, when you go to more clever math with snarks, well, 
now this becomes very easy and potentially in the future we can go scale this way. And it's interesting is what we've done is we've said, well, given how hard validation is in the adversarial environment, why don't we go let someone else do that validation? Why don't we let the person who actually cares whether or not the coins real do the validation? Potentially this is a way forward, you know, this is probably five years out, but we do have some hope there. And given we're uh, in theory supposed to be giving proposals, my proposal is actually fairly simple, which is we wait and see, you know, we should not make hasty steps to go and potentially push Bitcoin down into a new trust model. I would much rather see us make our baby steps. If we do a block size increase, great, but don't do a big one. You know, do something that's a small enough increase that it's still within the same kind of region that Bitcoin operates in right now. Take advantage of the true scaling tech that we can and see what happens in a few years. So with that, thank you. If there are questions, please raise your hand. I see three, okay. Hi, question about um, when you were talking about how sharding can't work because we need the whole history of the transactions. What are your thoughts on, say, then, if, if I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm not talking to the plausibility or, or the actual possibility of this actually working on Bitcoin, but what if, um, instead of history of transactions, you stored, stored checkpoints of balances instead? Therefore, then you could shard more or less because you don't actually have the histories to worry about. What are your thoughts on that possibility? That's actually a great idea, and uh, I've proposed it quite seriously to uh, fintech clients. Um, I have a bunch of software that working towards doing things like that called proof chains. But the really key thing with that is those checkpoints. I mean, who created the checkpoints? You know, some trusted entity did ultimately. And in a banking environment, it's certainly easy to set up the right social infrastructure to create these checkpoints. In a decentralized environment, it's not really clear how to do this, and. You know, I think if we actually went down that path, for a while it would certainly work, but this becomes a target for censorship. It becomes a target for seizure. You know, these, whoever the hell has the authority to create a checkpoint, if I want to shut down the system, I go after them. And even if the response is, well, you go into Reddit and kind of elect a new leader, that's probably enough to destabilize the system if done consistently. And equally, if that may happen to me by becoming one of the people verifying a checkpoint, I'm probably not going to want to do it. So I'm kind of hoping we're going to have math solutions to it. Snarks potentially, you know, and the recursive variant have the ability to compute the checkpoints for you, but I certainly wouldn't want to just sign off and saying, yeah, trust me. Question here in the back. Um, Peter, at the very beginning, you were talking about the relay networks, and um, one, one uh, question is, uh, wouldn't China be fighting the rest of the world, not just the U.S., in your example? And furthermore, it, don't you also have a prisoner's dilemma where China has to assume everyone else doesn't join the other side to get an advantage over their fellow uh, Chinese miners? Well, so so the, all I'm trying to say is it's a lot more complex than you, you well, gave it. Well, first of all, I'll point out that in my diagram, I'm pretending I'm incredibly ignorant of geopolitics. but. I mean, right now we're actually are in a position where China has uh, enough of a hash rate majority to go pull this off successfully. Uh, I think right now the numbers are they've got about 60% of the hash, hash power. And in this sort of attack I um, mentioned, you only need 30%. The other interesting thing is that attack kind of just happens naturally in environments where there isn't a block size limit. Because it is my incentive, of course, to process transactions for people and let people get their transaction through and make the system work. And without that limit, there's no clear point at which I should stop. You know, there's no clear definition of what spam is, for instance. And if I'm the guy with the most hashing power, or at least my blocks get to the most hashing power quickly, I'm going to end up earning more money naturally than the guys who have less. And I think that alone is enough to, over multiple economic cycles, cause a centralization pressure, simply because if I have 1% of the hashing power, I'm going to earn less money than everyone else. You know, and I think we should design systems that try to even that out to the greatest degree possible. Uh, so you mentioned this idea of client-side validation, where I prove that all the inputs are valid. But how would you, in this scenario, prove that the inputs have not been spent? Because 
proving the non-existence of a spending input requires basically the full chain, or is there a way around well, that? So this gets into the nitty gritty of how these systems uh, work. And one way you can think about uh, these systems is to think of it in terms of proof of publication. As in I prove to you as part of spending money um, that I have published that spend in a way that everyone who might want to get that information can get it. And simultaneously I prove to you that nobody else, including myself, has already published a spend of that transaction. And when you're trying to do this in a more scalable environment, you limit um, where that transaction can be published. So, in, for instance, a very simplistic model in my uh, tree chains concept, for instance, I could literally just give you the part of that blockchain to go prove to you that it has a mean double spent. Um, potentially with more sophisticated math like SNARKs, I could give you a compact proof that no, tra you know, no transaction exists that would have validly spent that coin from the time it was created to the time I claim it was spent. So a lot of detail there, and I think that's a good point, but I think we have potential solutions there. Okay, question over IRC. Um, someone's asking, yeah, when are you going to write the BIP for linearized coin history or tree chains? Anyone uh, want to go hire me? <laughs> I mean, quite seriously, like, I think a lot of this stuff's very far out. And, uh, you know, this is still a research project. It's not going to be something that happens overnight. I think we're going to see lightning deployed well before tree chains will be. But, you know, I'm interested in doing it and uh, see how that goes. Do we have a question over here? Yeah. Uh, assuming uh, at some point uh, a transaction with, uh, with fee at price free transactions, uh, you're talking on about client-only validation and the person who cares validating it, but miners always care about their fees, right? Well, that's one of the very hard things to solve, I think. And, uh, you know, the case of something like snar um, recursive snarks, this becomes very easy where you simply say, well, now when I try to go pay a miner to go mine my transaction, I now have a fairly compact proof that, yes, the money is real. Um, if you don't use clever math, if you use very simplistic stuff, uh, if I remember the numbers, you'd probably say have to give someone about 10 megabytes of data to prove the transaction is real, depending on how the system's set up economically. That's not exactly good, but it's not implausible that this could be done. You know, and essentially you would be giving the miner the proof that the money is real in a, you know, the same way you'd give anyone else it. You know, in that sense, the miner is the client. And what's interesting about a system like this is you could very well have multiple currencies coexist on the same underlying platform. You know, which raises economic issues. I don't think anyone's really thought through in detail. So, be interested to see what people come up with there. Question in the back here, Peter. I want to understand your linear coin history proposal a little better. And it sounds to me a lot like colored coin validation, where you're tracing specific coins back, and you only care about that path. Yep. Now, for that to work, is it the case that a transaction could be valid if it has invalid inputs, just the valid paths? remain valid? Yes, that's exactly it. In fact, um, what's interesting about a system like that is you can use this for privacy, where you deliberately attempt to go create an invalid transaction, knowing that some of the time you'll get away with it, some of the time you won't. And one good thing about encouraging this is sort of institutionalizing the fraud, if you will, um, can create a system that's more robust and that we actually exercise the code that handles that case. And like I say, I mean, if I'm not giving you that data, I have very, very good privacy. You know, if I go and have two coins and I go and simply ignore one of them and do a bit of magic to go create a fake proof, well, when I do get away with that fake proof, now I don't have to go prove to you where that other money came from, you know? And I think this is an interesting case where scaling naturally leads to privacy simply because you can't have a system that scales where everyone has all the data. We have one more question in the back. Hey, I have a question. So uh, the, what do you think about using miners or the blockchain not to verify anything, but just to resolve disputes? So I think Bitcoin NG, for example, uses something where um, you can basically put anything into the blockchain, and then people can submit proofs that a transaction was invalid, um, and then you use the miners' verification power just to, to resolve these disputes and do you think that could aid uh, scalability? 
Yeah, that's been um, actually brought up in Bitcoin for quite a while now. Um, interestingly, that approach is kind of hinted in uh, Satoshi's white paper, where he talks about SPV clients and says that they could receive alerts from their peers that a block is invalid. And it isn't a bad idea, but I'd point out it's a different security model than Bitcoin is, where you are relying on the existence of, you know, to get kind of technical, you're relying on the existence of a flood fill network, where you're expecting to have a pretty good chance of receiving notification that something's invalid. And that assumption is often not true. You know, I mean, if you uh, came over to my apartment and I uh, was feeling a bit, uh, bit mean, I might go and set up my Wi-Fi access point to go and limit your ability to reach the rest of the Bitcoin network. You know, I might go filter out every bit of fraud that you might want to see. You know, if I'm a large miner who's trying to go and create money out of thin air, you know, commit fraud in that way, I might run enough nodes on the Bitcoin network that's unlikely you're going to go find a node that's honest and would reveal that fraud. And, you know, without using very clever math, it's very difficult to uh, prevent these kind of cases. And I think one of the big worries is, well, socially, what happens if we don't detect the fraud immediately? You know, given the rate of mixing in the Bitcoin economy, if we found out even a few days after an invalid block was created, I mean, what do we do? Do we just roll back? Do we just potentially invalidate millions of dollars worth of Bitcoins? I don't really have a good answer to that. And I suspect the answer in reality, if you deployed such a system, would be we're just going to accept it and someone's going to get away with fraud and that's that. You know, and that potentially can destabilize an economy if people can create money out of thin air. You know, if people can go and seize other people's money. You know, we don't really have a clear idea of what, uh, what that'll lead to. Okay, thank you. One, one last comment. Anyone from the Chinese mining community have any questions or comments? Peter, you missed my one tea gong on that a bit. Uh, okay, my English better. Uh, so uh, there are two ways for mining. Uh, one way, uh, you get money from the venture capital, make it cheap, make it um, mining equipment, then mining like uh, 21, like a bit for it. The second way is the China way. China way, the way core funding like uh, BTCC, uh, like uh, BW, like uh, B and, and pool. They are raising money from the or community like each other. They raising Bitcoin, then they using Bitcoin to make chips, to make equipment, then mining, right? There are two different way. We use the Chinese way is not like the uh, Chinese way more friendly the, to the Bitcoin community, not like uh, you, you know every people want to uh, make a lot of the hashing power, then destroy this system. Everyone want to protect this system. Everyone, uh, my, every Chinese money pool together want the safety and the protect this system. So they want to come here to know, uh, do you have a, a suggestion? You know, you need, you, you, your suggestion, your solution way is wait after a couple of years, then we do something, scaling thing. But we want to, more better way, for example, with more communication, with more, uh, what a better idea is, uh, do you have uh, some better idea? Don't wait. What the question is, are there better ways, better ideas, solutions that doesn't involve waiting? <laughs> well, <laughs> so, you know, an interesting, I mean, uh, I was um, in China last week and an interesting story I heard about was how uh, there's been multiple occasions when Chinese mining operations have gone and loaned hashing power to other operations that, you know, say temporarily had a power cut or something, essentially as just good neighbors, you know, not necessarily um, getting any money even re in return for loaning, you know, a lot, of, a lot of dollars worth of equipment. And, you know, I'd say as a developer, that's certainly something that lets me uh, sleep well at night, knowing that I've got this extra layer between me and the harsh reality of crypto, in that you know we have a big community of people who behave a lot more altruistically than I think our assumptions built into the system are. But 
like Andrew is saying, we cannot rely on these kind of assumptions. You know, we need to design a system that still works in the face of adversary. It's, you know, if we're in a situation where that very friendly, very helpful, very good mining community doesn't exist for some reason, I mean, who knows why? Maybe it's because some Western chip company finds a way of making chips 10 times faster. You know, maybe it's because the ch government of China has now restricted internet in a way that we can't usefully use. I still want to design a system that's resilient. And to answer your question directly, you know, currently, to the best of my knowledge, I don't really have a good way of getting the scale we want immediately without taking risks that I don't think are acceptable. I wish I could give a better answer than that, but I think the, you know, my caution is pretty much um, predicated on how I think we can very rapidly deploy systems such as Lightning, such as Payment Channel. I mean, even simpler solutions like uh, Change Tip, you know, in situations where they work in a way that's less risky to the whole ecosystem. And, you know, I think we're better off if we take that cautious approach given how many billions of dollars we're dealing with here, you know. I wish I could go forge ahead faster, but I don't think the startup mentality necessarily works here. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Peter. Our next speaker is Jonathan Beer. Please come up to the stage. Jonathan will talk about why miners will not voluntarily and individually produce smaller blocks. Hi, yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, block size economics. Um, and a lot of this is kind of economic theory, so you know, I don't know if this is all completely right. A lot of it's just kind of speculation and maybe a bit um, contentious. So I'm just going to, like the basics of kind of supply and demand for um, block space. So on the x-axis, you've got transaction volume, and then on the y-axis, you've got um, the transaction fee or the price. So that's just kind of the basics of what normal economic supply and demand looks like. And in order for this kind of theory to work, you need a marginal cost uh, to kind of generate the supply curve. And there's, it's, there's a lot of contention over what the marginal cost is. So w what it basically means is the additional cost to a miner of including one more transaction in their block. And this cost is actually probably very, very low. It's only propagation risk and maybe a tiny amount of data processing. So I think that there's a kind of fundamental or potential economic problem here, which is the, the marginal cost is very, very low, whilst the cost of hashing is it actually needs to be high for security reasons. So in about 2011, people started discussing the idea we need an artificial cap or a block size limit or an economically relevant block size limit to artificially kind of prop up the fee market. Um, and this has always been quite contentious. And then recently someone's proposed that we have the orphan risk is actually enough in itself so we don't need a, a fee market. So orphan risks, oh, they are kind of a marginal cost. The, the larger the block, the, the higher the chance of orphan. Um, now, I've got some issues and why orphan risk idea might not be that great. The first is that technology improves, and, as, and over time, the technological cost of orphaning could get exponentially lower and lower. So you're relying on driving mining revenue or driving the fees with something that could beca become less relevant. And I also think that orphans, just by nature, are kind of bad, and that the aim of the system is to prevent orphans. Um, and another reason is that orphan risks in general, the larger you are, the larger your mining operation, because you don't need to propagate to yourself, then this basically incentivizes mining centralization, because a smaller miner will have to propagate to the rest of the network. A larger miner 
only needs to propagate to a smaller proportion of the network. Um, and the defense that people give to this is they say that orphan risk isn't really a great concern, it doesn't matter if it goes up, and that it's just another cost to miners because there's rent, electricity, salaries, and the Chinese already have a competitive advantage in, in all these other factors. So all we're doing is adding one more cost, which, if anything, is just increases decentralization because the Chinese already have an advantage in these other costs. But orphan risk is quite unique. Um, firstly, with these other costs, the, the econ economies of scale could run out. So if you've got very low energy costs because you're near a hydro plant or something, you're eventually going to use up the whole capacity. When the centralization risk from uh, being a larger miner related to orphan risk is an inherent property of the system. So it might always encourage uh, centralization. So at least, at least with these other costs, we can hope that the uh, impact eventually runs out, but with orphan risk, it might not. So, and then there's the question of how does marginal orphan risk vary when the block size varies? So as the block size increases, is the marginal orphan risk linear or does it exponentially go higher and higher? And basically, I argue that wh whatever happens, you're always going to be in quite a bad scenario. So this is a kind of illustrative example where the dark green line is the marginal orphan risk cost and then the yellow line below it increasing is the average orphan risk cost. So you can see, and then you've got the kind of, the other two lines are the, are the, are the fees or the kind of demand curve. So this like assumes that miners keep producing blocks up to the point where uh, marginal orphan risk equals the marginal transaction fee. And then you can see the kind of, the red area is the total, um, orphan risk, and then the yellow area is the total average fees. So even in this kind of exponential scenario, uh, you can see that that red area is a large proportion of the total revenue. So I think a key factor to look at is what is total marginal risk, total orphan risk relative to mining fee revenue. Um, and if, if I was to draw this line where there was a linear relationship between block size and marginal orphan rate, then it will basically say almost 100% of mining revenue would actually be um, uh, equal to the economic value of orphan risk cost. So I think that this is quite a potentially dangerous or potentially dangerous to kind of rely on orphan risk to drive um, the fee market. And then a very common question that people often ask is, well, why don't miners produce smaller blocks on their own? And why does, a, why does a fee limit matter anyway? Miners will just produce smaller blocks. And again, this kind of theory was discussed a lot in 2011, and it's that each individual miner um, wants to generate as much like cash as possible in the short term. So they want to include as much transactions as possible. So there's kind of two ways of looking at it. One is look at the whole mining industry as a whole. And then maybe it makes sense. Maybe the mining industry will want to produce smaller blocks to kind of protect Bitcoin. But it's actually made up of a lot of individual miners. And the incentives for each individual miner is they want to produce larger blocks. They want to generate as much cash and earn as much fees as possible. Um, now, a lot of people don't necessarily agree with this. They say this is kind of too theoretical. It's unproven game theory. It focuses too much on next block and not like the the longer term. Um, now, I think that this, this kind of tragedy of the commons problem, we can actually see that today in, in resources and commodity markets. So if you look at iron ore, for example, the miners are, keep producing more and more, so, and the pr price of iron ore keeps on falling. So although it is in the, in, it's in the benefit of, of the iron ore industry as a whole for miners to cut production and allow the price to rise, but the game theory doesn't work like that. They each produce as much as possible to generate as much cash for themselves. And the same happens in oil and gold. And these miners never end up voluntarily reducing production a bit. What they end up doing is they just keep producing as much as they can to keep producing cash flow in order to ensure that they survive. Um, and this is probably fine in most commodity markets, but for Bitcoin, 
we always need a healthy mining industry because it's always necessary for security. So but nobody is really right in this game theory. The reason it's, it's quite contentious is because there's a kind of spectrum of, of how miners think. One, one group of people say that miners care about the long-term interests of the system and they're playing the game of life. And then at the other end of the spectrum is kind of miners care more about the short term, more about short-term profit maximization. And the reality is no one's right here. It's, there's a whole spectrum. Different miners have different priorities. And what I think will happen is over the economic cycle, they, 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 this could just kind of naturally vary. So, for example, if the Bitcoin price is crashing, if electricity costs are going up, miners' profit margins are going down, then they'll kind of move, move towards the next block game theory end of the spectrum. And, and we need to ensure that this system is robust in all scenarios and can survive across the economic cycle. Um, so I think this kind of ties into what the previous speaker was saying. So when they were talking about the 30% uh, selfish mining attack from China, that only really applies if miners have the short-term game theory idea. Um, if they care more about the long-term interests of the system, then, then maybe they won't do that. Um, yes, yeah, so I think that we need to you know, be aware of the economic cycles and how mining incentives will change and try to build a robust, resilient system across economic cycles. So some people um, look at the system as it is now, and the reality is you know, everyone is collaborating, everyone does care about the long term. But there's a risk that that could change in the future. And because of that risk, we need to kind of you know, keep in mind everyone could all be very selfish and just care about the next block. Um, so now I'm going to talk a bit about BIP100 and why it might solve some of these issues. Um, so under BIT100, it's miners, of course, vote for the block size that they want. Uh, and rational miners should vote to maximize their revenue. Uh, some will care about more long-term revenue, some more about the short term. And what revenue is, is the block reward times the exchange rate plus the transaction volume times the average fee times the exchange rate. So this is this will mean that miners are voting in quite a balanced way. So at the moment, people in the community are kind of debating the relative importance of the fee level or the transaction volume level or the exchange rate. But BIT100 will mean miners kind of dynamically vote in a, in a balanced way, uh, reflecting these competing priorities and trying to maximize the product of these things. And they'll, they'll make their decision based on what they think about the expected elasticity of demand for transactions. So this is a kind of illustrative example of how it could work. So now the, the supply curve is now just a straight line, and miners will just vote to shift that to the right or left, depending on the level of demand. And, and what they're trying to do is like maximize the area under the graph or maximize their fee revenue. And again, this is quite contentious because a lot of people don't like this kind of straight vertical line supply curve because it implies that the um, it implies that, that blocks are always full, whereas other people have a vision where there's always excess capacity. And I, I don't think we should kind of make a decision now over whether we want always full blocks or whether we want excess capacity. What we need to do, I think, is, is just keep our options open. So don't adopt a scaling proposal that locks us into like, constantly increasing block sizes such that we never have these full blocks. So there's, there, I don't think we've got enough information now to have a right or wrong answer. Instead, we should just try and keep an open mind, have a moderate increase, or adopt this voting proposal that allows, it allows us to go in either direction in the future. Um, a common criticism people have is that BIT100 is a cartel. Um, and I, I admit it does have some characteristics similar to how cartels operate. So it enables cartel-like pricing whilst avoiding the difficulties of an actual mining cartel. It's kind of like an open framework that allows miners to decide on the block size limit in a transparent way, um, which I think, I think it's a good idea because if we don't do this, there's a high risk that miners will form a cartel anyway in order to kind of restrict supply of space and blocks and drive up prices. So creating this BIT100 transparent structure could actually act as a way of preventing an actual cartel 
from forming. Um, and another, another proposal I have is I think we need to recognize the difference between an increase in the limit and a decrease. So an, an increase in the limit actually requires approval from all full nodes um, in, if it's a hard fork in order to accept the larger blocks. Whereas actually a majority of mi miners can impose a decrease in the limit anyway without the need for any a hard fork or any change because 55 percent of miners or whatever can always reject um, any block larger than amount so they can form this cartel anyway and this is why I think that these voting mechanisms should always have reflect this power balance so I think there's a proposal that uh, it requires 80 percent in order to decrease the limit whereas I think it should always be 50 percent because say 79 percent vote for a limit reduction and then no limit occurs because it requires the 80 percent this is kind of like advertising that 79 percent of miners want the limit down and I think this will serve as the catalyst for, for, for the formation of a cartel anyway if 79 percent of miners have the power to reduce the limit they, they could just ignore the voting procedure so there's a risk that the voting could be undermined so I think that any of any of these voting processes should always have the that bear in mind how the actuality works and allow 50% of miners to kind of insert their will and reduce the limit if they want. Um, at the same time, I'm not claiming that Bit100 is perfect. There's a lot of problems. People have pointed out that it's kind of, it's the block size limit will be suboptimal and will maximize the utility for miners and not users. Um, but I, I mean, it's very difficult to say because utility for users is kind of very subjective anyway um, and then I think I like BIP100 from a kind of economics perspective so there's a lot of like much better technical experts than me that will have other objections of you know we can't increase the limits so much so I'm in favor of kind of upper and lower bounds um, and I think th there are no perfect solutions and I think we need to be kind of pragmatic and work together and be willing to compromise and accept something that we don't like uh, because there's a lot of pressure and you know, some people are very keen to move in a particular direction so I think there's a lot of good proposals out there that seem okay and I think it's important that we we agree on, on something um, otherwise you know there's going to be a criticism that nothing's going to happen um, thank you very much and if you've got any questions Hi, um, thanks for your talk. Um, so I had a, another idea that you that I wanted to hear your take on. Um, so rather than uh, creating this uh, consensus mechanism where you have the block size changing as a way of uh, miners determining what the supply for block space should be, why not uh, use uh, miner policy, a non-hard fork, non-fork related uh, uh, aspect to control the uh, minimum price uh, available? So basically uh, creating a fee floor for inclusion of a transaction into a block. Um, have you thought about that before? Have, what do you think about that? Um, and it, the idea is basically that you'd be using altruistic punishment um, in order to enforce the fee floor. Uh, miners could set a certain per percentage of their hash power as a way of intentionally orphaning people who, or miners who uh, try to break that uh, minimum floor. I'm not sure that I like this idea. I just wanted to hear your take on it. Um, yeah, I thought about it a bit, and I think it's an interesting idea, but <laughs> I think this has, people already don't like Bit100 because it's kind of like putting a, the miners in control and you know, manipulating the market to some extent. Having a fee floor kind of manipulates the market even more and is likely to make people even less happy. Um, and yeah, and I think yeah, that, that effectively is a mining cartel and we want to kind of avoid that cartel as much as possible. I just wanted to add one word or one term collective bargaining, that's all. We have another question in the back. Um, I've noticed that uh, some miners have credibly said that the one megabyte limit is already straining the network quite significantly. Um, what do you think is the, uh, the prudent approach is that we're talking about scaling the network larger than one megabyte. However, other proposals uh, have suggested that it might be prudent to go and 
take a bit of a wait and see approach. Do you think that the uh, comments from the miners that one megabyte is already difficult enough should be taken seriously? Um, yeah, I think it should be taken seriously. Um, so I, I think we shouldn't rush to have a big jump up in the block size now. Um, and I think we need a moderate, prudent approach and balance that considers everyone's opinions. Um, but I think there's a risk that if we don't do anything now, then you know, the community could kind of split into two with some people very, very keen to have an uh, aggressive schedule. So to kind of react to that, we need to, if we have some kind of moderate proposal now, it will make the position of the, of the other side of the argument more, more difficult to kind of break away. So I think remaining together in one group is really important. We have another question in the back. Sorry for me. And I'm Hugo again. And can I ask you a question? Because I noticed about the, okay, you can design the limits of the transaction. And if they're highly, what is the biggest limit for you? And if they decide to vote for the bigger limits, will that be affordable to the funnel holders? And with these limits, will that be really good to the miners to gain the profit? A and because of the Bitcoin reward halving, and what is the advantage to be where the transaction spamming like stress test or <coughs> is regarding the, what is the BIP 100 or so on? Um, yeah, I, I think you're maybe you're asking about you know, the spamming and that that people were filling up the blocks by just creating spam transactions and you know, why were miners including this spam? And I think it goes back to before. It's kind of the game theory is that miners just want to eventually, once a fee, there's enough fees, they'll want to include as much transactions as possible. So eventually, all blocks will be full. Wh whatever reason people are using it for, whether it's for spam data storage. So th that's why a lot of people have this vision that all blocks are full rather than having these kind of excess capacity and not having all blocks full. A question here. Um, yeah, just a, a quick uh, comment slash question. Do you, do you think that there would be value in the equation that you showed in calculating the value of the block to basically um, add a, a multiplier around that whole thing that is kind of the uh, per percentage likelihood of increase that you have in getting the next block as a factor of block size, right? Because theoretically, as the size increases again, as we get these, you know, these concentrations of mining, you get an advantage by the block being bigger and delaying propagation to other people. Do you think that's a factor worth building in here, or do you think it's just too small to worry about? Or um, yeah, I don't know because of course that is an advantage, but at the same time, it's a disadvantage because there's a higher probability of orphan. So that, at the moment, that higher probability of orphan is probably much greater than the kind of the theoretical selfish mining attack that you'd, you'd have more chance of finding the next one. So that, that of course, depends on each individual miner's hash rate. If you own 35%, then sure, you've probably got an advantage of creating a bigger block. If you own 1% or less, then you've got an advantage in creating a smaller block because you don't want to be orphaned. So that, that, that element, the that the calculation would think depend on each individual miner's circumstance. Okay, the last question in the back. Uh, I just saw that uh, you said BIP 100, BIP 102, and 103 are somewhat reasonable proposals, right? What is your stand on BIP 105 and 106? Sorry, I, I don't know those. <laughs> <laughs> those are in BIP proposals on GitHub. <laughs> Okay, well, <laughs> we got to go to break and think about those proposals. <laughs> All right, we have a 15-minute break. Come back at 12.15. Thank you very much. <laughs> Coffee is on the right side. Face the stage to your right. Thank you, Jonathan.
think I just broke my rule. Boom, boom, boom. That's it. It's good to set these counter examples because it makes everyone else feel. No, I was actually rule. Yeah. No, no. So, I mean, but, okay, there are some of us in this space for whom. Uh, who, are, who are on that side where uh, I'm happy for my comments to be repeated. Um, okay. Explicitly. Uh, I mean, all my stuff is open. Uh, the open and I, I'm very comfortable with that. And I don't have any sensitivities, like, you know, designing or commercial confidential stuff. It's just not even on my radar. So I am kind of in a fairly lucky position. Uh, but it's important to, it's important to, that we keep that awareness. Because there's, you know, certainly a lot of people here who. And, and also, it sets the standard for other people who maybe didn't come because they were nervous about things like that. If we make it very clear, it makes it easier in the future. So no, no, there will be no, this rule if people will be respected. And, and this was respect. And, and that would, that's what, we're trying to be consistent. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Set the rules straight. Um, yeah, so yeah, that's totally works. That's totally works. Yeah, it's going to be very Are interesting. Are you a tag team? I know. Yeah, we're, we're, <laughs> we're tagging. Yeah. <coughs> Welcome back. Please have a seat. We'll get started in two minutes. Yeah, I think so. And uh, that one is coming, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that'll flip it. Yeah. I think we'll get that as well. Yes. So I'm going to try to get some sort of Kali. Yeah. How do you spell it? How do you spell it? Uh, Kalle. Kalle. Oh, great. Kalle. Yeah. yeah. Rusty Russell. Yeah. Kalle. Yeah. Well, it's actually my nick. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. It's actually Carl. But right, uh, but I think it sounds pretty dorky, so, so I think it's, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's good to have a unique first name because then it, it, it simplifies mapping. Absolutely. It's just yeah. Having yeah, a unique yeah, first name yeah. is good. Yeah, uh, instead of Carl, if you Google Carl Rosenbaum, you'll get hips. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Oh, they, they stole a second from us. <laughs> no, I think they added one. I think we get a bonus. Or maybe that's. No, but. Oh, I, two, that's that's it. That's it. Yeah. Sound, yeah. sound check, one, two, one, two. Sound check. Sound check, one, two, one, two. We could have done that. So, what we'll do is we'll switch positions because that's the mic. Um, so yes, yes. Yeah. I will just stand here looking pretty or something. Yeah. So Switch. Do what you're doing best. <laughs> <That's weird. laughs> I can translate into sign for you. Yeah. So I don't know sign language, so it'll be completely made up. Uh, okay, let's get started. Grab a seat. You know, we're not time, we're not timing. Okay, before we get started, I want to remind the audience about the code of conduct, photography rules. The guideline is for privacy reasons and for no attribution reasons, please do not take any pictures of any of the attendees. Many attendees want to remain private individuals, so do not have any of them in your photographs. I believe it's okay to take pictures of the speakers, of the stage, and I think the slides are also okay given that we're all simulcasting and uh, broadcasting it, okay? So no photographs of any attendees. Let them remain anonymous and private. Okay, and uh, uh, for Chinese speakers, please ask your questions in Chinese and I'll use American English to translate. Chinese uh, Okay, thank you. So our next speaker, uh, we have two speakers, Kale Rosenbaum and Rusty Russell. Please welcome. They will speak about IBLT and the weak block propagation performance. Please enjoy. Can we get the uh, slides up there? So, great, thank you. So, uh, I'm Kalle, and this is uh, obviously Rusty. Uh, we will talk about uh, block propagation and how it can be improved by using IBLT and weak blocks. I will start by talking about uh, invertible bloom lookup tables, IBLT. And uh, first, credit goes to Gavin Andreessen for putting this idea out there. And 
We also acknowledge the work of uh, Michael Goodrich and Michael Mitzenmacher for their 2011 paper on IBLT. IBLT allows for efficient set re reconciliation if sets are similar. And that could, can work great for, uh, for Bitcoin blocks if mempools don't differ too much. I will briefly describe how IBLT works. Uh, you have this block that you want to propagate to, to appear and uh, you take each of the, these transactions and you chop them up into slices of fixed size and then you run each slice through a number of hash, hash functions and those hash functions will give you an index where to add the slice. Um, adding a slice will, will bitwise, bitwise XOR it into the IBLT so the IBLT will not grow when you add data to it. And when you're finished, you will take this IBLT uh, and send it off to the peer. The peer will receive it and uh, make a guess on what transactions you have put in there. So he will take each transaction in, in his guess and uh, remove them in the same way that I added them uh, by slicing them up and hashing them to get the index and then remove from those cells. And then what's What's left when he's finished is the difference between the block and the recipient's guess. And now if this, if this IBLT is sparse enough, those differences can be extracted and the transactions reassembled from there. So we'll do some simulations and, and for those we need to nail some parameters. Uh, the first one is the number of hash functions to use and the second one is the value size or the slice size. Uh, in my previous slide, I had three hash functions and 64 byte values, slices. Uh, I will show you where those come from. To find a good value for, or, or a good number of hash functions, we, uh, we searched for the smallest possible IBLT that would successfully decode 100 transactions. And it turns out that uh, there is no point in, in, in having more than three hash functions. And then we did, we did the same for value size. It's not very sensitive, uh, but we picked 64 byte values since it seems uh, at, at least marginally best. Now, we want to see what happens when, when, uh, when IBLT is used in a real world scenario. So we used Rust, this Bitcoin corpus project that covers uh, 721 blocks from four different nodes. The average block size in this uh, set is 380K. And we will only focus on the Australian node in, in this set right now. Um, so we ask how small can we make this IBLT in order to successfully uh, transmit 95% of the blocks to Australia? You have on the, on the x-axis here, you have the failure probability, and on the y-axis, you have the IBLT size. So with an IBLT of 21 kilobytes, that's 5.7% of the average block size. Uh, you, you will successfully transmit 95% of the blocks. And further, if we, uh, if we use an IBLT of 10 kilobytes, that's 2.6% of the average block size, we can successfully transmit 94% of the, of the blocks to Australia. This is of course based, uh, I mean, this is a stupid solution where we use a, uh, a fixed sized IBLT across all block transfers. Uh, Rusty will tell you more later about uh, dynamic IBLT sizing and further improve on that. So now we want to see what happens when the number of differences grow. Uh, to do that, we, uh, we will select a number of, of differences uh, randomly from the, from the blockchain and we will also select an IBLT size and then we will encode and decode those transactions and uh, see if it fails or succeeds. And then we repeat this a ridiculous amount of times to measure failure probability. This is one way of, of visualizing the result. Um, the lines here represent from top to bottom uh, 
32 differences, 64 differences, and so on, down to 10, 24 differences. And for us, uh, okay, on the, on, the, on the x-axis you have the failure probability, and on the y-axis you have the, the diff cost. That's the IBLT size divided by the number of diffs. So the first thing we can notice here is that for a certain failure probability, um, the diff cost will decrease as the number of differences increase. And also, the other thing we can note is that there's a sweet spot right below the knee of each of these uh, lines. Um, that means that we can, we can decrease failure probability uh, very cheaply down to that specific sweet spot. Also, that sweet spot will mo move towards zero as the number of, of differences increase. For example, uh, the sweet spot is at 1.5% uh, for, for uh, 32 differences, while the sweet spot is at 0.1% failure probability for uh, 10, 24 differences. Okay, I will, I will, sh I will uh, illustrate this with an ex example. We have to make a few assumptions uh, in this example. Uh, we will assume here that the number of differences uh, increase linearly with transaction rate. And we will also assume that the block size increase linearly with transaction rate. The corpus averages about six diffs per, uh, per block. And now let's uh, pretend that we, the transaction rate increases by a factor of 10, 100, and 1,000. That would mean that we would uh, have to encode six differences for factor one, 60 differences, 600 differences, and 6,000 differences. Uh, what would that look like now if we, if we target 5% failure probability? As we saw uh, in the earlier graph, uh, the, the diff cost will decrease as the number of differences increase. And that's, uh, that's what we see here as well. Um, you have the factor one on your left and the factor, factor thousand on your right. An IBLT encoding a typical block today uh, would take about 2.2% of the, of the block size but that percentage will Im improve as the number of differences grow uh, or as the, for each tenfold. Um, we will end up with less than 1% of the block size uh, if the transaction rate would, would thousandfold. This is, of course, based on the assumption of linearity between uh, uh, transaction rate and, and uh, differences. So, so far, uh, we, have tested on, we have tested the fixed size IBLT on, on uh, the Bitcoin Corpus project and seen that 21K is enough to uh, transmit 95% of the blocks. And we have also seen that IBLT has some uh, really nice uh, scaling properties. And I will hand over to Rusty now, who will take the rest. Thank you. Cool. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to dig down a bit and I'm going to talk about the proposed Bitcoin IBLT protocol that we have. Um, so, I like pictures. Here's a picture. That's our block with all our transactions in it. Um, and there's node one mempool. The node one, uh, this is the node receiving the block. Its mempool looks very similar to the block. Um, you can see there's, it's got, there are three transactions, sorry, two transactions, the red ones, that are in the block but the, it doesn't know about. Uh, and there's some ones, there's transactions it knows about that are not in the block. So, effectively, um, in our algorithm, what we do is we basically take the things that we didn't know about, throw them into our mempool, uh, and we remember how much that was, in this case, two transactions. Okay, so our result with that, that included is our node one mempool kind of looks like this. We pick a point in this, we order this by fee rate, okay, and we assume, hey, you basically have to have paid about this much per kilobyte. Uh, in order to get into the block. Except for these ones, we have a set of things that um, we would have expected to get in the block that didn't, and similarly we have a set of transactions that got into the block despite being below our fee hint. 
Now, if we want to send this to node 2, we take that hint information that we've assembled uh, and send it through. And as you could see, if I flick that, uh, basically node 2 uses that information to trim its candidate set, basically trim its mempool. Um, this refinement turns out to be particularly important. Um, and that, that, that hint is encoded quite, quite densely, so that's pretty cheap. Then, of course, we send through the IBLT, um, and it does the subtraction and hopefully recovers the three um, transactions it didn't know about and discovers the one extra one that it had put in that what didn't belong in the block. Okay, now one thing I skipped over here was sizing. Here I said that the node one guesses the size of the IBLT to be about 24 buckets. How does it figure that out? It turns out that mempools, at least across the corpus, uh, were pretty similar. Uh, in fact, the big difference was in the block that was received. A whole heap of block was full of stuff that we'd never seen before. So what we do is we go, okay, let's assume that the block is about as similar to the recipient's mempool as it is to our mempool, and then add some extra factors to cover the fact that it might be slightly different. Okay, so we have two ways to do extra factors. One is a fixed amount. Let's assume, say, that they have you know, they, they're, they're going to have two transactions that they won't have that we had. Uh, and the other one is just to have a multiplier. So if you have, this is on the z-axis is the number of um, transactions that you assume that they don't have, and on the uh, x-axis is basically the extra factor that you choose. And of course, it's a linear relationship that you bump these factors up, your IBLT gets bigger. But your recovery probability is not linear. So you squint at these numbers for a bit and you play around and the answer is you basically add 10 slices to the number that you would have needed to reconstruct the block and you multiply the whole result by 1.35. And that, across our 826 megabyte transmission across the corpus, gives us a result of about 20 megabytes transmitted for 95% reconstruction or about 2.4% of the original transmission size. So in this model we, in this model we have um, we use a very, very simple assumption across the corpus. The first node across of these four nodes in the corpus to receive the block, we pretend that transmits an IBLT to all the others to tell the other nodes about it. So that gives us our 826 megabytes. In this case, we've cut it down to 20. Now, 4% of these blocks are actually sent raw. It was basically, we figured out how big the IBLT was going to be, and it was going to be bigger than the block itself, so we just send, assume we send the block uh, unencoded. Now I'm going to switch gears. Awesome. Weak blocks. So this is an idea that uh, was previously called uh, near blocks. Peter Todd talked about it, like most things, years before I'd heard of it. Um, so I called them weak blocks because I didn't know about his work. Um, and the idea of weak blocks is completely different, so forget everything you've heard about IBLT. Basically, miners send blocks that didn't quite make the threshold. Um, these are cool because they're naturally rate limited because they take a lot of work to produce. Um, they offer some kind of provable insight into what the miners are actually uh, mining. And importantly for our discussion, all blocks can be simply encoded in terms of previous weak blocks because they'll kind of be similar. Um, so when we're talking about propagation, that's what we're talking about. So here's a weak block number one, a weak block number two, we're ignoring the coin base. And you can see it's basically the same thing with some more transactions tacked in, right? Assume a simple two-byte encoding. This is the dumbest thing you could possibly do, which is basically you say, okay, this weak block is, you know, the previous weak blocks, you know, Transaction number 18, number 1, number 3, et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, you tack the ones that it didn't include before on the end. So we assume basically a two-byte overhead per transaction. So we take our corpus, because I love the corpus, and we uh, randomly generate a weak block. We assume one of the peers generates a weak block on average every 30 seconds um, and transmit that instantly to the other nodes. So then when we hit a real block, we just encode that against the last weak block that everyone knows about. Okay, so remember our raw blocks gave us uh, 826 megabytes. If we assume we generate a weak block on average every 30 seconds, we end up only transmitting about 35 megabytes to represent the strong blocks. So in order to send a strong block, we've only had to transmit that um, small percentage of data. The total amount of data, however, almost doubles. Because now we're sending all the weak blocks as well. Okay. Now, whether that matters or not depends on your perspective. Yes, you're using more bandwidth, but you're not using it at the critical point, which is that latency of transmitting your strong blocks. So which of those numbers you care about is relative. Um, so it's a good result and a bad result. Now, we can actually do a little bit better than this by introducing super weak blocks. So 
it turns out, and there's a really good point in the corpus where we get a, a row of full blocks, right? Uh, this corpus is from, from months ago, uh, like almost 12 months ago now. Um, and we were seeing full blocks back then. And we caught some uh, in the corpus, which is really nice. Uh, and when blocks are full, and in a world where blocks are always full, this will always be true, um, you want that first weak block as soon as possible. Because if you get a strong block before you hit a weak block, you can't use weak block in coding. So wouldn't it be nice if the first weak block was you allow that to be 16 times weaker than a normal weak block, which means and instead of average every 30 seconds, you get one average every two seconds. Um, <clears throat> hand wave over what first is in this system. But that cuts down from 35 to uh, 27 megabytes. And our total only increases a little bit. So there is some benefit in doing that, and certainly a huge benefit when we're looking at full blocks, because that primes the pump for those full blocks uh, and gives extra savings. So now. There are real limitations, and I really just like the way I simulated this on the weak block corpus. Um, in the corpus, because the, I'm pretending that the peers that we're talking about are actually generating the weak blocks, now those peers are all very, very similar. In practice, in the corpus, the actual blocks are more different than the blocks, than the mempools of the peers, so we would expect worse compression than this in practice. Okay. But with that aside, now. Everybody likes ice cream, everyone likes ketchup, so let's put them together. IBLT and weak blocks. Remember, we had 826 megabytes when we sent the raw, and that's just you know spraying out to all three of them. We got 95% recovery in 20 megabytes with IBLT. We got down to 27 megabytes, or one and a half gig, depending on how you measure it, for weak blocks. If we do both, we drop the cost of sending the strong, the, the strong blocks, the critical ones, uh, down to 15 megabytes, and we actually bump up the accuracy to 98% reconstruction. Um, and we drop the 1.5 gigs sent uh, down to 233 megabytes overall, but we get a horrifically bad reconstruction rate for the weak blocks. We can tune the IBLT dynamic estimator to get that 95% number back, but the reason I hate this result is that this is actually an artifact of the way we simulated the blocks. It's not real. Um, the weak blocks propagate instantly in my model, so they overtake the transactions that are within them. So in that case, you know, your, your IBLT hurts pretty badly because it's got a whole heap of transactions that haven't been seen yet. So uh, order of magnitude, yeah, there's definitely some wins in here, but take those numbers with a huge grain of salt. Okay, so let's assume what, what would this look like when we actually deploy it. So we have a, a, a new, basically, uh, block transmission message, um, and this allows us to do either IBLT or weak blocks, um, which is pretty straightforward. We just linearize it all. Of course, you've got a problem with deployment of weak blocks. If you go, we're going to produce one every 30 seconds, you set the threshold to a 20th of the normal setting uh, difficulty, and uh, until anyone deploys it, you won't see any weak blocks in the network at all. So we can ratchet it up from an incredibly low difficulty and work our way up. That's fairly simple. And there are a whole heap of other interesting things that we can do. Um, and I put them on this slide because I knew I would run out of time about now. Um, so we have a, um, we can do much better with our, um, if we reduce canonical ordering, and in fact blocks are now coming out very close to canonical order with version 4 blocks. Um, we can do some Coinbase encoding, uh, where we actually send the Coinbase in weak blocks and we encode against previous Coinbases, because co average Coinbase is about 580 bytes, uh, is, that's the mean. So we can save some extra things there. Um, and if blocks are really, really small, we can send them out unsolicited and drop the latency of the network significantly that way. Uh, and finally, I wanted to mention we can use IBLT to synchronize mempools as well. Okay. Thank you. So we'll take questions. <laughs> Question here. Can you talk a little bit about um, adversarial conditions where a miner may decide not to uh, send transactions in IBLT for the purpose of slowing down other? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yes. Um, so. Our IBLT model um, does not assume minor co cooperation at all um, because the IBLT is generated between peers. So the miner can send out a full block, but then we IBLT it. Of course, they can generate something that sucks to IBLT, right? They can put stuff in the pool, in, in the, you know, if, if we've never seen it in the mempool before, IBLT doesn't help you at all. So they can still make a block that is terrible to propagate, just as they can make a block today which is terrible to validate. So. I don't, I think, you know, we obviously can improve the, the best case, um, but the worst case, the adversarial case, there's not much we can do about. You will fall back to 
sending, sending plain blocks about. Um, in a world where miners are living off fees, that may have a cost for them to fill a block full of crap. But at the moment, we actually do see it on the network. And it's in the corpus. We see blocks that we've got nothing in common with our mempool, and we just have to send them raw. We have another question over here. Uh, can you say anything about uh, encoding latency in terms of milliseconds and how the uh, network latency affects it? Can you give some r rough numbers for yeah. what that would take? So encoding is fast. Is that rough enough for you? Um, IBLT encoding is actually pretty pretty damn fast. There's a lot of XORing. Um, there's some hashing. Um, one of the overheads is that you really can't use the transaction ID for hashing. Uh, at least you can't use it straight because if you get IBLT clashes, it's, you can make an IBLT that can't decode. Now you can detect that and you can send that transaction in the raw if you want to, but by definition a miner who's trying to minimize the size of their things they're sending out uh, is going to start dropping transactions that conflict with other ones. So you could then do a DOS if you could create some of those conflicts. So the, the cleanest way to do that is to basically have a secret uh, and rehash everything. Uh, re rehash the transaction IDs to produce 48-bit IBLT IDs. Um, and that has some cost to it. But it's pretty damn cheap. Like it's cheap enough that, that, that the model where you customize it for each peer makes a lot of sense. And follow up, um, how many round trips is it? Is it just one or is it two? Just one. You send the IBLT and if, if they reconstruct it, you're done. Um, obviously, if they have to go, oh crap, and fetch a manual block, then yeah, you've got a second round trip. Another question back here. Uh, during your testing, have you tried to see what happened when different nodes have different policy on mempool? Because in the wild, not everybody has the same mempool, right? Yeah. So we didn't. Uh, it's a very good question. Um, so originally, we were going to do a dynamic uh, sizing based on uh, your previous interactions with the peer. You could guess how close their mempool has been historically. And you go, okay, so we're, you're, uh, we're obviously a bit out of sync, so I'm going to bump up the IBLT size. Uh, we can still do that. Um, we didn't have to do that for this. But that will also allow us to optimize even more and I think reduce our IBLT size e even further in the case where we do happen to be in sync with other peers. Um, but we will, in, in real deployments, we would have to take that into account as mempools diverge because of policy reasons. Any other questions? Okay, question over here. So if I'm understanding this correctly, the weak blocks would be published by the miners? Yeah, miners so would, would pushing out the weak Can you blocks. talk about like the, the cost versus the incentives of miners to be publishing them? Um, and like what, what would change with the sort of game theory if say we were experiencing a slew of full blocks with huge mempool backlogs? Yeah, so uh, if you publish your own weak blocks, then you speed up your transmissions of strong blocks if you find one. Um, you potentially speed up other people's as well, but if most people are doing it, the, the, the gain is net to you. Um, if you know when he's doing it, then the first person to do it does kind of pay. So having this ratchet scheme makes sense. So you can have even tiny miners start producing them. Um, the uh, particular, I, I referenced the fact that we could do Coinbase diffs, because your, your own Coinbase tends to be unique. So generally for weak blocks, it's a, it's a wash. But your binary diff of your Coinbase and your weak block versus your Coinbase, if you get a strong block, is probably pretty damn small. So maybe we should do a diff encoding to kind of encourage you to publish your weak blocks because you could save another half a K uh, on big blocks. And you know, when, when we talk about um, you know, really getting aggressive with mining optimizations, maybe that half a K is worth something to you. Okay, one last question here. So yeah, regarding different policies, can, uh, and I already talked with you about this, uh, can we have just uh, one mempool with everything you've seen for everyone and just your own mempool for what you want to mine? Yes, absolutely. So I talk about a mempool here as if it's the current mempool, but really the mempool could just be anything you think somebody might have, including conflicting transactions. Um, you know, uh, you, you can throw those in. Um, in fact, you can have things in your mempool that you would never include in a block yourself. Um, that you, you'll still do the same trimming step and it works pretty damn well uh, in practice. So you can certainly, if, even if you're not interested in everything, you can certainly have a, basically an extra mempool of, of extra stuff uh, very cheaply. Okay, thank you very much. Great speaking. Thank you, Kale, and thank you. Thank you. Next, next speaker is Arthur Gervais. We'll be speaking about 
tampering with the delivery of blocks and transactions in Bitcoin. Thank you very much for the introduction. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, so this is work. Uh, this is work I've done uh, with my co-workers at NEC Research and ETH Zurich, uh, tempering uh, with the delivery of, of blocks and transactions in Bitcoin. So as everybody knows, I guess here is everybody is very familiar with Bitcoin. I mean, we are talking about a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized currency, and we don't have any banks. The blockchain is a distributed ledger where we gather transactions uh, periodically in blocks. And uh, a particularly important layer that, uh, that I'm addressing today in this talk is actually the broadcast protocol. So why is the broadcast protocol important? So if you look here at this figure on the left side, let's assume that this peer is actually creating a, a block or a transaction and propagating it in the network. So it goes one layer, it goes a second layer, and you notice at this point the rightmost node has only one link to the potentially adversarial node here. If this node is not forwarding a uh, transaction or block, it ac ac effectively performs an eclipse attack, such that the node will not know anything about this, uh, this particular transaction or block. And uh, such an eclipse attack is bad because it creates the possibility of a denial of service in the most simple case, but there are more sophisticated implications, such as double spending or other things that I will present later. So eclipse attacks are Famous. I mean, Halman et al., for example, at Usenix this year, they have shown how they can be performed in practice in Bitcoin, in the real network. Um, they, however, had a couple of assumptions. So, first of all, the adversary needs to monopolize the connections of the victim, such as in this figure here. Um, it needs to spam with new addresses on the network layer to inform about new IP addresses. It requires the node to actually restart in order to connect to, to the adversary nodes. So, and therefore it requires also many IP addresses, so many bots that are required to in order to attack this node. So in this talk, and in the associated paper to this talk, we actually present a technique that we can actually perform an eclipse attack, such as this one, with only one TCP connection. And we don't do any prior uh, assumptions about the connections of the victim. Uh, furthermore, we don't need any victim restart. So. This is actually a very realistic attack. So how do we do this? In order to explain it to you, I have to talk about the scalability measures that we have on the peer-to-peer -peer network layer. So the first one is the transaction block advertisement. So how do we advertise a block in the network? So it's very important to note that we, before uh, bro broadcasting the transaction itself, we actually advertise its hash. So it's just the simple hash of the transaction or the block. In the second step, then, we have the transaction block request management system where, uh, given the hash, if I don't know about hash, I would just ask for the particular transaction or the block, and that then I would get it from an honest peer. Currently, one of the scalability measures is that we actually request it only from one peer. And if this peer doesn't respond, well, we need a request timeout. So let's say here is an adversary, he advertises a transaction or block to a peer then obviously we want to receive this, but the adversary is not responding. In the meantime, there might be another peer advertising the same transaction or block, right? So at some point in time, we have to time out here and we get the transaction or the block from the other peer. So these timeout settings in Bitcoin are currently set to static. So we have, for, we have a 20 minutes static block timeout and a two minute transaction timeout. Okay, so, so far these are the scalability measures that we're looking at. So how can we uh, abuse these scalability measures? So in, in, our, in this talk, basically we are presenting a technique where we can blind a victim from blocks and transactions for longer than 20 minutes. And we have performed a per an experimental validation in the actual Bitcoin network. So this has been done and implemented. So we show the impact in this talk in, sp in particular regarding double spending of transactions and a possible network-wide denial of service attack. And if you're curious, in our associated paper, you will find details about aggravated selfish mining. 
And uh, more importantly, we propose a couple of countermeasures that harden the network because in order to, to avoid these types of attacks, and in the paper you can as well see an estimate of the waiting time for secure transactions. So the first requirement in order to perform this type of attack, this blinding technique, is that the adversary is the first peer that advertises a transactional block because the first peer is the one that we requested from. So once the network advertises a hash to the adversary, the adversary should forward it as fast as possible to the victim such that the victim says, okay, thank you, this is a new hash, I will wait for you to send me the actual transactional block. So we have to be here, uh, here we have to be faster than the network. The second requirement for the attack to work is that the victim should wait. As I mentioned earlier, we have 20 minutes timeouts uh, for blocks, two minutes timeouts for transactions. So we validated the first requirement as being first by implementing a node in Zurich at ETH, and we had on the other side about 10 nodes distributed across the globe, and um, so simply the, 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 the node in Zurich got the hash, advertised it to the other nodes uh, that we attacked, so our own nodes in the, in the network, and if we have been fast enough to relay this first, faster than the network, we counted this as a success. So our numbers, just to give you here a couple of numbers, are actually independent of the connections of the adversary and the connections of the victim. So these are actually connections to full nodes, so no SPV clients here, because they don't forward data, so it's ir irrelevant. What's interesting is actually that the more connections the adversary has in the network, well, the earlier he gets information, so we had about 90% probability of being first re of relaying a hash. The second requirement is waiting. Okay, let's first take your transactions because they're a bit easier. Um, so for transactions, we currently have a FIFO queue. Um, so if an adversary advertises a transaction hash multiple times, there will be a two minutes timeout each time. So in this case, a six minute timeout in total. And we're done. So this is um, basically, this is the technique for blinding a peer from a transaction. So for blocks, however, it's a bit more tricky. So after 20 minutes, what happens? Typically, we disconnect and we do nothing. There's, uh, there's, however, a special case that if we receive a block header, the node disconnects and requests the blocks from another peer because the block header already indicates, oh, there's something out there, we should get it. So what is the requirement to delay a block for, uh, blocks for more than 20 minutes to a particular node? So the first requirement is that we must not receive a block header. Why is that? Well, as you may be familiar, in Bitcoin, there is a header-first synchronization. So we first get the header, and later we get the block associated to the header. So, and the header already indicates, oh, there is some block available, and therefore the client actually uh, requests more aggressively the block. So we need to avoid the situation. The second um, requirement for this attack to work is that the victim should not receive a version message. So why is that? Because at connection initiation, both peers, they say, hey, I have block height 10. The other says, oh, I have block height 15. And then one node says, okay, I, it seems I'm, I'm a bit back. Please send me the new header such that I can sync with the latest blockchain. So in order to avoid this version message exchange, we can basically occupy all open connection slots of a node such that this node does not create any new connections. We don't make any assumptions about existing connections because there will, won't be any version message exchange. Okay, and the requirements for the adversary are as before, so still we need to be the first one that relays the hash, as we, we said before, and we can perform, we should perform the connection depletion in order to delay blocks for longer than 20 minutes. So just to go a bit more into detail, uh, this is actually a walkthrough of, uh, of a particular example. So let's say we have an adversary and we have a victim here. At a given point in time, we find a block B, okay? The adversary chooses to not attack. Both peers sync to the main, uh, sync the header first, then sync the blockchain. So they're both at block B. After some time, there will be a new block, B plus one, which is found. So now, the adversary actually chooses to attack. He syncs with this, to the current block B plus one, but at the same time, he advertises the hash of block B plus one to the victim, effectively triggering a 20 minutes timeout for this particular block. So the victim doesn't know anything about block B plus one, stays at block B. After some time, there's another block B plus two, which is found. Again, the adversary chooses to attack. 
Again, he chooses to advertise the hash, triggering another 20 minutes timeout for block B plus two. So here the, adversary, uh, the, the victim actually won't learn about B plus two and he still is not aware, not aware of B plus one, so he doesn't know anything. And you may know that at this point in time, the timeout for B plus one is expiring. But since we assume that the victim has not received any header, he won't do anything. He will not request uh, a new block anywhere because he has no proof that there's any new block. So the adversary can just re-advertise the same hash, effectively re-triggering a new 20 minutes timeout. So and this is actually the point where we can extend the, the delay uh, uh, above 20 minutes. Let's say block B plus three is found and the attacker, I mean, either he's unsuccessful or he decides to stop the attack. So he won't advertise any new uh, hash to the victim. So the first timeout that actually expires here is B plus two. Um, and at this point, um, the victim will learn about B plus three. But since he cannot, uh, he doesn't know about B plus one uh, and B plus two actually in this in this case. So he can st he cannot uh, he still cannot sync to the main blockchain. Um, so because the other timeouts are still pending. So the first timeout that expires here is B plus two. And at some point in time, finally, the timeout for B plus one expires, and at this point in time, the victim is actually able to resync to the main chain. Okay, so it's kind of an interactive, basically, way of of advertising hash and and waiting, waiting, uh, uh, and re-advertising the the hash in order to re-trigger a timeout. So our expected success is the following. So on the x-axis, you can see the number of consecutively denied blocks. Uh, to a particular victim, so we went up to 30 consecutive blocks. On the y-axis, you can see the probability of success. Um, we base these uh, this expected results actually on on p equal like uh, about 80 percent, which is reasonable, and we we've seen this is realistic in our setting. And our measured su success, so what we actually measured in the network, is this one. So they're pretty much equal. So this means we can deny five consecutive blocks with about 40% probability. It's quite a amount of time. Okay, so what's the impact? I mean, why should we matter, right? The first and most important impact probably is double spending. So what is double spending? I guess most of you are familiar, just a brief recap. We have a legitimate, we have a double spend transaction. The adversary is, is uh, advertising two different conflicting transactions. The, eventually the, uh, the, the vendor is accepting the payment if he doesn't wait for block confirmation. He provides the goods and services and then the, eventually the majority accepts the double spend transactions and the, the, the victim basically is, won't be paid. Okay. So in this particular setting, given the delay of the block and, and the transactions, we can do uh, the following attack. So we can blind the vendor from accepting a particular transaction. So let's say TX double spend. So we just advertise the hash, right? The vendor will, um, the, the adversary will then forward this double spend transaction in the Bitcoin network. And since the vendor is blinded for this particular transaction, the vendor won't request this particular transaction from the network, so he won't receive it. Now, the adversary can send a legitimate transaction to the vendor. But since uh, the, the vendor will try now to broadcast this in the network, but since it's conflicting with the double spend transaction, well, the Bitcoin network will just reject it. Right? So and at this point in time, if the vendor accepts zero conf, well, the game is over. The only requirement here is that the adversary knows the IP address of the Bitcoin node of the vendor, which might be a strong requirement based on, on your setting. The second impact that we that we would like to point out is the of service. So if you assume 6,000 reachable nodes, I mean, I know we, we lost some in the last weeks. Um, um, if we want to prevent the, the delivery of blocks and transactions to those 6,000 nodes, I estimate that we need about half a million of TCP connections, which is not that much. And we only need about 600 kilobytes of advertisements per block every 20 minutes for the 20 minute timeout. So this is not that much of a requirement for a network wide dinner of service attack against all public Bitcoin nodes. Okay, so what can we do about that? So why don't we make the smaller, uh, the, the static timeout smaller? I mean, this would be maybe a, a small and easy fix. 
Well, we did some measurements here, and actually it turns out that we might cut off some lower nodes, some, some smaller bandwidth nodes by doing this. So this depends basically on what should be the requirement to run a full node. Okay, but why not request a transaction or block for multiple peers? Well, that's the scalability, right? If you, if you um, request a block or transaction for multiple peers, you will just need more bandwidth, there will be less bandwidth available and so on. Uh, what about alternative relay networks? So there's Matkorada's relay networks. Obviously, this is a great solution for miners if they want to receive uh, uh, blocks. And this is something, uh, I would say, additional, which is great, but we still need somehow a reliable native peer-to-peer -peer network in Bitcoin. So there's a security risk, a scalability trade-off that we need to take into account here. So what we propose are actually ba dynamic timeouts. So based on the object size, so on, on the size of the transaction, on the size of the block, the timeout should be not static, but, di but dynamic. We can also measure the latency to a particular peer, maybe even the bandwidth to a particular peer. Um, second of all, we should handle the transaction advertisement differently. There shouldn't be a 5 or queue. So we should, first of all, filter by IP address. So I want IP address, for example, can only advertise a transaction once. Um, in addition, we should choose randomly some senders and not just in, in a FIFO setting, right? So we can, sh and if we don't receive a transaction, we can first request from one, then from two, and so on, to be sure to receive it at some point in time. Most importantly, we should update the block advertisement, and this is actually something which is now a milestone in, in 0.12, um, that uh, the, the, the block propagation will be based on the hash, uh, um, uh, based on the block header instead of the hash only. So this is a big improvement, I think, that has just been made into, into 0 0.12, and this will mitigate the, the block attack that I just presented significantly. So to, to summarize, so we have shown that the scalability measures that are currently in place in the P2P and network layer actually impact the security of Bitcoin. We have shown how to delay a transaction or block for at least 20 minutes, and one TCP connection for that is sufficient. And we have shown the impact of double spending. I refer you to the paper in order to read about aggravated selfish mining. And we talked briefly about the you know, service here. So we, we, have, we had uh, a couple of proposals on how to harden the network, you know, to be more resilient against these types of attacks. And in the paper, you can also see an estimated minimum waiting time for secure transactions. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Questions? We'll keep them short. I noticed you went and uh, said that um, reducing those timeouts may make it an issue to run a full node. Wouldn't that not apply, though, given that we're talking about blocks being fetched from a peer? Um, yes, I think it would apply also to the setting. Um, so we have seen that, I mean, I, we did some measurements with a Bitcoin node with 256 kilobyte downstream, 120 byte upstream, and that we actually reached a time of 20 minutes. I guess what I'm saying is, if I'm running a full node on a bad bandwidth connection, the fact that you time out before you get my block isn't really a big deal, so long as, um, so, so long as you know, if if I do have a block that you don't have before, you still eventually get it, which I think would be true. Yes, I mean, in, in this set, in this setting, is true for the for the fast node, it doesn't matter that much. It's more the the slow node that will be affected. Yeah. Any other questions? There's one in the back. So uh, about the results, um, did you pre-select uh, the target or was it uh, on a random node? No, no, we took uh, 10 um, Amazon yeah, EC2 instances and just installed the vanilla Bitcoin client there and let it sync to the blockchain and then we just, uh, I mean, we didn't change any parameters. What was default default network settings, and um, we just connected to it. No, what I mean is, uh, so you're attacking a node. Do you pre-select which node you're attacking? Ah, uh, sorry. Uh, definitely, yes. Okay. So you have to know the the IP address of the peer that you are targeting, right? Otherwise, uh, so in the in the example of the double spending, for example, you need to know the IP address of the vendor in order to to attack it. Okay. Uh, this is answer your question. No more questions? Okay, we'll go to the next session. Okay, thank you very much, Arthur. Excellent talk.
Our next speaker is Jonathan Tumin, and we'll speak about BIP 101 block propagation data from the test net. Hello, Ni uh, Hao. So my name is Jonathan. Um, I'm a Bitcoin miner, and I'm also a mediocre C++ programmer and a neuroscientist and a few other things. Um, I'm also on caffeine, so I'm going to be going pretty fast through this. I've, I've got a lot of uh, stuff to cover, so um, bear with me. Uh, so my, my perspective on scaling Bitcoin is that it's an engineering challenge. It's something that has problems. These problems are not impossible. They are... Uh, somewhat complicated, but they can be fixed, um, and we just need to do the work to figure out how to fix each problem as it comes. Uh, my favorite uh, proposal for how to scale Bitcoin is BIP101. I like the predictability of it. I like the uh, fact that it scales over 20 years. Um, that's going to give us time to implement the software fixes that we're going to need in order to be able to uh, really get Bitcoin to a large level. And also, I think that um, hard forks to increase the block size limit are hard, and soft forks are a lot easier, so it's a lot easier to decrease the limit or to uh, put hold on the limit than it is to increase it. So I think that we should have the strategy of hard forking once, or hard forking infrequently, and then doing uh, progressive uh, short-term limitations when we run into scaling problems. Um, so in theory, what we would need in order to be able to handle, oh, by the way, BIP 101, let me just go back and say that. Um, eight megabytes uh, now, or in uh, January 11th, and then doubling every two years for the next 20 years, eventually reaching a size of 8,192 megabytes. Um, that's what uh, BIP 101 is. Um, and uh, that eight gigabytes would require, in theory, a large amount of computing power, but it's not an insane amount of computing power. Um, we would need about a 16-core CPU for like a, a 3 gigahertz uh, uh, per core uh, CPU in order to be able to, to do the SIG ops, the um, ECDCA uh, signature valid validations that we would need in order to be able to validate the transactions. We'd need a fair amount of RAM. We'd need to be able to handle you know, a few blocks worth of transactions in mempool plus some overhead and some other stuff, the UTXO set, et cetera. And then the, the kicker, the hardest uh, thing for us right now is actually the block propagation. Um, and in theory, we could do that with a one, me one gigabit uh, uh, internet connection. That would give us, um, it would take about one minute to upload an eight gigabyte block. Um, and you could use IBLTs or some other weak blocks, et cetera. You can use uh, several things in order to be able to pre-transmit that data and only transmit a small amount of data when each block is found, basically the header and um, some other stuff. Um, but there's you know, a problem. Our code is not efficient. And that's particularly the case with, uh, with the block propagation code. Um, the RAM stuff, RAM usage is not too bad right now. CPU is uh, okay, and it's going to get a lot better in a few months when uh, libsec, P libsec P256K1 is uh, released. But the block propagation code itself is actually, um, in my opinion, really, really bad. And uh, we can do a lot about that. Um, and the effects of uh, block, bad block uh, prop propagation rates have already been talked about by P Peter Todd and others, uh, so I'm not going to go over it too much. Um, but you know, the quick idea is that uh, currently China has 65% of the uh, hash power. Um, in actuality, not all of that hash power is uh, running on servers in China because most of the uh, Chinese mi most of the Chinese po uh, pools have servers all around the world, and they do some of the uh, block creation abroad and some of it uh, domestically in China. Um, but uh, the Great Firewall is a big problem in terms both of performance and also just in theory. I mean, the, the purpose of the Great Firewall is to censor and to control information. And uh, that has some problems for, for Bitcoin. So it makes me uncomfortable to um, have so much hash power uh, subject to uh, that, um, uh, that system. Um, also, the, the problem for propagation uh, over the Great Firewall may be asymmetrical with the current um, block propagation algorithm. I might talk about that, I might not, I don't know. It's not really that big of a deal. Um, so we wanted to figure out how big of a problem this block propagation thing is, and we figured that uh, Gavin had already done some tests using reg test mode, which is kind of like test net, but predictable. And I thought I would try to do something else. I'd try to make things unpredictable. I'd try to see uh, what happens when all sorts of chaos is going on. So we chose to do it on testnet. 
um, we got uh, about 21 nodes uh, under our control, under uh, 10 under my control and uh, 11 from uh, various users on Reddit. Uh, mostly they were mid-range VPSs, but we had a few uh, vastly underpowered uh, machines too, a few uh, um, NAS boxes running Intel Atom CPUs and stuff like that, just to see what happens. Um, and our data collection method was different from most of the uh, methods that I've seen in the past for measuring block propagation. Um, G Maxwell and uh, the user Lightsword use Stratum to see when a block is being uh, offered by uh, mining pools, and they've done a lot of work on that. What we did was we uh, started wa to monitor the debug logs, and we added extra debugging information to the debug logs to see when, in uh, with microsecond resolution, uh, an inv message was received and, and all the other uh, parts of the block propagation uh, process happened on each node. And then we collected all those debug logs from our servers and uh, did some central analysis. Um, the data that we've got so far, uh, I finished doing the analysis, or finished compiling yesterday at about 12 p.m. So um, there are a lot of tests that I still want to do that I haven't done. You're going to get a subset of uh, our goal. Right now we only have uh, mining data using our uh, London server. So uh, everything that you're going to see is coming out of uh, a London block uh, broadcast server. Um, I hope to soon have a, a switch over to uh, a Beijing server, but I um, uh, haven't done that yet. So uh, maybe in a few days you'll be able to see some, some more varied data. Um, also, while we were doing these uh, tests, we ran into a few bugs in our data, uh, one of which was a X Bitcoin XT specific uh, bug that uh, was in an unreleased version. It was only in the master branch, um, but we were using the master branch, so we ran into that. Um, we fixed that about three days, or two days ago? Three days ago, yeah. So uh, the data before that is about three times slower in some circumstances than it should be. Um, we also ran into a bug that affects, or it's not really a bug, but a performance issue that affects both Bitcoin Core and XT. Um, and that's, uh, actually there are two different variants of this, but they're both due to uh, locking. Um, the git block template code locks CS main, and a bunch of other stuff also locks CS main. So uh, if, a, if a node is mining, then all of the code that locks uh, CS main can't run while you're creating a new block template. And uh, in some circumstances, it can take five, 12 seconds, 30 seconds to create a git block template. So that's a huge amount of latency that you can add. Um, and uh, one of the, well, yeah, I'll, I'll run in, I'll tell you about one of those uh, uh, issues uh, in a few seconds. So uh, here are the nodes that we had, just a quick look. Um, so most of the uh, top ones were mine, the ones below were uh, contributed. Notice that we have two machines that use uh, Intel Atom CPUs. Um, so we were, we were ha uh, giving them nine megabyte blocks and seeing how they did. Uh, hint, not very well. So here's how uh, block propagation works. The protocol starts with an inv message, which is a way of saying that uh, Alice, in this case, has a new block in her inventory. And she sends that to all of her peers. Uh, typically, that's about 20 peers. It's usually eight outgoing connections and then some number of incoming connections, maybe 12, maybe 20, maybe 40, who knows. Um, so she broadcasts that message to everybody that she knows all at once. And then uh, Bob, will look and if he has that block already, he'll ignore it. If he doesn't have that block, then he does two things in quick succession. First he says, give me the headers, tell me where in the blockchain that fits. And then immediately afterwards he says, and give me the actual block data. Um, one problem that we ran into is that the git headers function locks CS main. So if you are doing git block template, you can't as actually uh, submit the headers, uh, you can't actually propagate the blocks. Uh, until your git block template finishes. And uh, one quick hack to get around this is to do git data, git headers, git data. So you send the actual block data first, and then you send the headers second to tell where it fits in, and then you have to send it again to um, handle a, a, a side issue. Um, so uh, Bob says git data usually, um, and then Alice says, uh, here's the block. And then after that, after uh, Bob receives the actual download, he still has to verify it. And when that completes, it finishes with an update tip message. So in our testing, we monitored the inv message arrival at Bob's computer. We uh, ignored the git data request, but we did collect that. And then we uh, measured when the uh, 
the block message arrives, when the block is finished downloading. And then we finally measured um, when the block was actually added to the, uh, to the blockchain for Bob's machine. Uh, and we did this for all of our machines. We also collected some other data which we haven't analyzed yet. So on, on a macro scale, uh, the block propagation looks kind of like this. You've got uh, each computer uh, that gets the block uploads to several different computers. Um, usually this is about 20 machines in parallel. Now, this means that no computer gets the block until after uh, the machine finishes uploading pr to pretty much everybody at the same time. So for uploading a one megabyte block to 20 peers um, at one megabyte per second, it takes 20 seconds, not one second, before anybody uploads. Um, so anyway, uh, but you'll see uh, this kind of line diagram where you, you can see the, the transmission time and the verification time um, in our data. Um, all right, so that's uh, it for the slides for now. I'm going to move over and I'm going to give you a quick hint about the, the severity of the China situation. Uh, so the, the, these are um, some of my uh, nodes in China. This one is uh, Beijing, Beijing, uh, Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Hong Kong. And the ones below are my European nodes. And I'm going to download a eight megabyte file uh, via HTTP from all of these nodes at the same time. And we'll see if it happens the way it, it usually has been. Um, all right, so the European nodes are mostly finishing now. The last one is finished now. Oh, that was actually uh, North America. And you can see that over here, Beijing is downloading at 200 kilobytes per second. And Shanghai is downloading at 50 kilobytes per second. Um, a few days ago, Shanghai was faster than the rest. Uh, a few days ago, uh, Beijing was faster than the rest. So uh, this situation changes dynamically from day to day, uh, sometimes even from hour to hour. To hour. Um, a few hours ago, Beijing was a lot faster than this, now it's, now it's slow again. Um, so obviously, if, if a node is only downloading at 30 or 40 kilobytes per second, you're going to have problems. Um, and we did have problems. Um, but only with the Chinese nodes. Anyway, so, um, so here's our tool. Uh, oops, I should uh, mention, please do not visit the URL that I just uh, showed you, uh, because this is running dynamically off of our web server, and I don't want it to get hugged to death until after the talk is done. So um, please hold off in, on uh, visiting this for now. Um, all right, so here's uh, a list of the 50th percentile time for uh, block transmission for each one of, for each one of these machines. Um, some of them have uh, an extra dot, so this one actually is using Mike Hearn's thin blocks patch. Um, it doesn't seem to actually help that much. I think we uh, still need to tweak it a little bit, but uh, most of them don't have that. So you'll see the first dot is when it receives the inv, second dot is when it finishes downloading, and then the third dot is when it finishes updating uh, the tip of the blockchain to include that block. And you'll see that the times for uh, most of these European and North American and uh, non-Chinese Asian nodes are around 10 to 20 seconds, which is possibly tolerable, a little bit high, but uh, not disastrous. And then we, if we go down to China, uh, and also to one of our uh, underpowered Intel Atom CPU machines, you'll see that things start to get really bad. Um, over here, we've got a scatter plot. Um, you, some of you might have seen the data that Gregory Maxwell uh, collected. He found that uh, if you're looking at stratum times, you see a, uh, a block uh, propagation time of about 10 seconds uh, for a one megabyte block. And if you look at our data, you see about, about the same. Um, so about 10 seconds for one, megabyte, one meg on average. Um, you can also see that there are like different groups. You've got the... Um, the orange stuff with a, a steeper slope, and then you've got the green stuff with a shallower slope. Um, so that's uh, an indication of the distance mostly from the mining node, in this case, London. So the orange is mostly Europe and North America, and green is mostly Asia, including China. You also see uh, a lot of scattered off uh, uh, dark green stuff in, in the uh, various areas. Um, and then there's a, um, most of this data came from when we only had um, like one machine that wasn't one hop away from the mining node. So that one machine that was getting it on the second hop is actually uh, this blue down here. Um, if we go to uh, 
time since that node saw the block instead of time since the block was mined, then we see the blue actually is uh, mostly downloading it very, very fast because it's downloading it from a machine that is not overloaded. Um, so anyway, uh, so yeah, our, our data looks to be similar to what people see on mainnet for uh, propagation through the whole network. Um, but we're seeing that over one hop. And the reason w that we're seeing those differences uh, is that, um, sorry. Uh, because I forgot the slides, right. Uh, Yeah, so um, we have fewer nodes, but uh, the main effect is that we don't have the relay network. And the relay network is absolutely huge in the effect that it has. Um, also, uh, I set this, uh, these tests up with a few people off the internet in about you know, two weeks, so uh, things aren't exactly optimized. Um, and we also have uh, a bunch of Bitcoin core nodes that are connecting to our nodes, and they're downloading blocks, but they're not uploading them. So they're just wasting bandwidth. Um, so yeah. Uh, that's why we see the difference between the Gregory Maxwell data, uh, well, sorry, we, we see the similarity between the G Maxwell data here and uh, the, data, the data that we have uh, over here. Yeah, okay. So, uh, uh, once you get around to it, you can play around with this. There's a lot of different options on here. Uh, but now we're gonna get into the individual blocks. Um, the ones at the top, we don't actually have data for all the machines just because of how long it takes to upload the multi-gigabyte log files. Um, but down here, we've got data for most of our nodes. And you can see um, this gray line, by the way, is actually uh, one of my Beijing nodes, but I just didn't have it named. Uh, over here, we've got the uh, Intel Atom CPU. So you can see it downloads the block quite quickly, but it takes about 70 seconds to validate it. And that's just because the CPU is um, uh, totally insufficient for this task. And again, you see over here, um, so th this node, uh, Came, is in Germany, it received the block from a second London node, not the mining node, but just a nearby one, um, because the mining node didn't have that many connections. Um, and yeah, it downloads the block in about six seconds, and in this case it took about 22 seconds to validate it. These validation times will get a lot faster uh, once we have libsec 256 uh, k one um, but for now they are quite a uh, significant thing. Also these uh, validation times can be addressed by uh, changing the, the way in which blocks are, uh, are propagated. We can propagate unvalidated blocks by using a special bit to indicate that they're not validated so SPV miners don't get them, or sorry, SPV uh, wallets don't get them. Um, down at the bottom of the screen, you will see sometimes these graphs show up like that. And that's the uh, traffic for that node. And you can see that it's often very short and peaky um, these machines tend to have pretty good uh, internet connectivity. Um, and also, the algorithm that we're using for uploading these blocks doesn't use uh, bandwidth effic efficiently. It just uses it for a very short period of time until it's uploaded to all eight peers that it has, or 12, 20 peers, whatever. Uh, and after that, all of that uh, bandwidth is completely wasted. Um, if you connect to more peers, then you use bandwidth for a longer period of time, but the latency per block uh, increases. So we've, we've got like this nasty optimization problem that we don't need to have. Um, uh, let's see, we can also look at the uh, peer that uploaded to this peer by pressing shift. And we can see when uh, data was uploaded to that and then when it uh, started uploading data to the next peer. And there's quite a big gap in there and that's, that's basically the, the validation delay. So we can also use that empty space. You can use that time when the peer has the data uh, but hasn't started uploading it to anybody else because they haven't finished downloading the block and uh, uploading it. Um, if we look at the Chinese uh, nodes, we see all sorts of crazy stuff going on. Um, in this case, it took uh, one, 160 seconds to download the block because uh, bandwidth during the entire time was very poor. This is Shanghai again, which uh, I showed the, the problems with doing wget. Um, let's see, there was one that I liked. Um, yeah, uh, here's a thin block. Uh, most of the traffic is actually afterwards. This is the, the bug in thin blocks right now, I think, that we need to track down. Um, so I look at these uh, and I see that most of the rest of the world can handle large blocks. They can definitely handle two megabytes. They can handle four megabytes. Uh, eight, nine megabytes is starting to push it, but uh, I think we can do it. Um, China, though, cannot. 
Um, and where did it go? Uh, Um, and I think we need, we need to do something about that. Um, so here's some optimizations we can do to the Bitcoin uh, block propagation protocol. We can move verification into a parallel path so it's done asynchronously. We can also do a lot of data compression like IBLTs or uh, weak blocks or uh, just sending the transaction hashes. That's a very simple optimization instead of the full transactions and using them from mempool and then doing back and forth to get them out. Uh, we can do all sorts of stuff. We can also uh, start to upload in multiple directions once uh, the first byte is received or the first chunk is received and make it more like block, uh, BitTorrent. Um, I have a proposal called BlockTorrent for that. Um, but the biggest thing I think we have is that uh, we need to get the Chinese uh, pools to take their, uh, their block creation out of China. And we can do that uh, using the, the Stratum protocol. We can still create the Coinbase transaction and stick that into the, uh, into the header in China, but we can do everything else with transactions uh, outside of China. And this means that we only need one kilobyte or so of traffic across the Great Firewall, regardless of what the block size is. Um, and I think this w by itself can mostly fix the China uh, issue that we're having. Um, I'll be around in China for the next 20 uh, days or so. If anybody wants to collaborate with me, um, I I'm happy to do so. I will also be working on implementing BitTorrent or the block torrent. Uh, over the next couple of weeks. Um, work with me. Yeah, thanks. Uh, here are people who helped. Um, that's it. Questions? Thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> Question in the back. Thank you. So, uh, by the way, I have a lot of questions, but I will try to be short because it's going to be game in, in the long discussion. So, yep. uh, First of all, I'm pretty skeptical about increasing the block size for eight megabytes. Everything what you have shown, it's pretty synthetical tests. So it's small network. Uh, normally in Bitcoin network, uh, on the statistics, what I was collecting, the block propagation came in at least through 12 nodes. It's meaning if you have one megabyte block size and it's take 20 seconds to download, so you should multiply it to 12. So if you increase it to eight megabytes, it's meaning 120. If you're multiplying it, okay, at least for five. So it's meaning it will be uh, delay at least over five, 10 minutes, even in shortest one. So uh, the next one, so uh, if we are talking about the Bitcoin and blockchain, so increasing eight megabytes, meaning 500 gigabytes per year for a blockchain. And we have a lot of limitation in the Bitcoin. I will just list five limitations in the Bitcoin, and my question is how you would like to solve it, because right now I'm thinking it's uh, requires a longer way, and XT doesn't solve it in short, but if you are able to reply on five questions, that's okay. So the mempool, um, yeah, the mempool size. My talk uh, is just about block propagation. I don't have time to address the other questions, so I would appreciate it if you'd restrict it to the, to the block propagation. Okay, uh, if you are talking about block propagation, so uh, did you perform the simulation for a biggest network? Because uh, what you have shown, it's only tens of the nodes, but in real life, it's required for a normal simulation at least 500 nodes. Yes, so um, cr we don't have the relay network. Uh, and uh, so that's one difference between us and um, mainnet. Uh, the, the node count is another difference between us and mainnet. Um, the relay network takes a much shorter path between uh, mining nodes. So the distance between mining nodes in terms of the number of pops decreases, and also the size of the data that's sent uh, uh, likewise decreases. Um, what I was trying to get at with the Maxwell data is that if you use that as a calibration factor to try to adjust for those two uh, large uh, opposing effects, you see that our block propagation data for one megabyte agrees mostly with mainnet's block pro propagation data for one megabyte. Um, it's not the perfect answer, but uh, that's the data that I have. Um, next question. Yeah. My main question about large block proposals like this one is, uh, is about the uh, Hard hardware, the storage hardware costs mm -hmm. uh, uh, related to uh, uh, running a full node. Mm -hmm. um, so what is uh, your 
can you make an, an estimate about how that will develop uh, with this proposal? And if you assume uh, in that estimate that we, uh, uh, you only need to store the uh, UTXO set, do you think uh, it is wise to wait until we have UTXO set commitment before we do uh, BIP 101? And if you assume Moore's law, uh, can you uh, uh, go a bit more into the detail? Have you been thinking about uh, what kind of hardware technology would be needed? Mm -hmm. And for instance, how many atoms do we need to store a bit? Uh, so <laughs> um, so my, my two uh, quick answers to that are um, checkpoints and uh, pruning. Uh, those can reduce the storage requirements for the blockchain by a large amount. Um, there will still be a few people who want to store the whole blockchain and they'll make it you know, archivable and available for uh, the general public. Um, we also have quite a while before we get to the eight gigabyte uh, things. I don't know how, uh, how what ferromagnetic RAM and other technologies are gonna progress. Um, I suspect that with checkpoints and with, uh, or even without checkpoints, but just with, with pruning, uh, it'll be fairly cheap to run a full uh, miner or a fully validating node, because those don't require the full history, they just require the UTXO set. Um, and we already have some uh, block printing code in uh, Bitcoin Core, it's just not quite done. Um, yeah, for the, for the history, uh, we don't need to store that at every single full node. Um, we just need it for the people who want it in an archive. Yes? We have another question back here first. Uh, okay. First, I'd just like to say, please keep it to one question at a time and keep it pretty short. There'll be time to talk to the speakers later. Yeah, I'm around for a long time, talk to me. Um, my email is not there, whoops. Go ahead, ask your question, please. Uh, so at the beginning of the, the presentation, you talked about issues if we, uh, if we raise the block size. Sorry, uh, talked about what? Uh, there could be issues. Issues, okay. Yeah, but you didn't talk about what these issues are. And on a worst case scenario, what could happen? Um, so we ran into a couple of bugs. Uh, or um, locking issues. Uh, there are performance, performance issues in Bitcoin Core and also Bitcoin XT. Uh, one of the performance bugs was just in uh, Bitcoin XT, it's fixed. Um, there might be other uh, performance issues. Um, the, main, uh, the main serious issue that we have is the issue that Peter Todd talked about in his talk that I felt, the, felt no need to reiterate. Um, that's it, when we have 65% of the hash power in uh, a country with bad internet connections that can cause everybody else to need to move to that place with bad internet connection just to remain competitive to have access to those blocks. And um, that's not good for decentralization. Um, does that answer your question or is there something else? What could happen? Um, Bitcoin could start a nuclear war somehow, I'm not sure. <laughs> How, uh, how big of a UTXO set size were you testing with? Uh, this was, um, let's see, the, the blockchain was 3.3 .3 gigabytes when we started. Um, I, I didn't look at the UTXO si set size in particular. Um, sorry, can't answer that question. Uh, I can look into it. Question here in the back. Um, it, it seemed like your blocks always uh, uh, were transmitted from London. Did you, do you have any data where the blocks were generated in, in China in particular? I'm, I keep con I'm a little concerned that we constantly think that the, the internet issue is something that circles China and doesn't pervade China. Mm -hmm. And it, those are two very, very different models. Yeah, so um, I don't have uh, data from mining in China yet. However, I can uh, do a similar test, which I actually prepared for, in which I download the file from a Chinese node. Um, pick a city, Beijing, Shenzhen, uh, Shanghai, or Beijing. Shenzhen, okay. Good choice. Uh, well, this isn't here. This is, this is all of my notes. Oops, darn, I thought I had that. Do you need the screen, Jonathan? Oh. oh, we lost it, darn. Okay, well, I'll, I'll just tell you, um, the Chinese nodes have all finished. We've got 26% on uh, Washington. Uh, we just finished in Tokyo, London, and Newark. 
um, the bandwidth on the Chinese nodes was uh, three megabytes, well, 2.6 megabytes up to 7.8 megabytes. Uh, 7.8 megabytes for Shanghai, which had the worst performance earlier. Now it's the fastest. Shanghai actually has good internet. It's just getting some packet loss from uh, the Great Firewall. The, um, yeah, uh, Washington had 515 kilobytes per second. Uh, Tokyo, 804 kilobytes per second. Uh, Singapore, still waiting. It's, it hasn't even started downloading yet. Uh, 552 kilobytes for Newark and 980 kilobytes for London. Um, yeah, sorry about the loss of data. We were using TeamViewer to show my laptop. Um, next question. We have one more question. Uh, so hi, um, you say that you don't have the relay network and you're not able to test yet with like block compression, mm -hmm. but like um, maybe it's actually more realistic to, to test without that because then um, it, it is a lot closer to a adversarial situation. Yeah, yeah and that's, that's one of the reasons why I didn't include it. Um, the, the main reason was laziness and lack of time, um, but uh, I also did want to try figuring out situations in which uh, it could break and see how it broke. And we did break it a couple of times, uh, but not in any ways that we weren't expecting. Um, oh, by the way, we also hard forked uh, testnet something like six times uh, and also mined for um, about a day with uh, slightly less hash power on the uh, BIP 101 fork than we had on the, the main fork. So it was like, it was basically just orphaning every, every block. And that's expected behavior for how a hard fork should work. So at least that one, uh, that works pretty well. All right, I think that's okay. it. Okay, thank you very much, Jonathan. <laughs> okay, next, next up is lunch. Are you guys excited about lunch? Yeah. Okay, lunch is gonna be out to your right. So a quick announcement about lunch. It's gonna be one hour and 20 minutes. We'll be back here before 3 p.m. for the miners panel. And for lunch, it's a brown bag lunch. So you get to pick up your own lunch and, disc and meet your colleagues and fellows. What happens is we're using these tags to assign colors. There are four topics. People can assign these choices. Essentially, if you are a developer, you could choose to put on an orange tag to identify yourself. If you're a miner, mining pool, use a green tag. If you're, if you're here for business related stuff, use a blue tag. And the press will have a purple tag. Okay, pink, purple. So pink is for press, orange for developers, Green is for miners, blue is for general business. Please enjoy your lunch and be back by 2.50, 2.55 p.m. for the miners panel. Thank you. Yeah, for the tags, they'll be available out on the lunch tables out there. You can add them yourself or come to me quickly right here. Go ahead. Which one do you want? Just put the color tags on your name badge to identify yourself.